Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Today, we are interviewing Jared and Ashley Jones. It is April 28th, 2023, and we're in part two of a two-part interview. Uh, uh, part two is going to be talking about what happens when you're a Mormon parent and you discover that uh, multi-generational abuse has occurred within your family in the sense that you grew up experiencing abuse within a Mormon context. And then you discover, unfortunately, that uh, one of your children has been abused also in a Mormon context. So uh, thank you for joining us. I'm here with my uh, brilliant partner, Margie. Hey, Margie. Hey. And uh, if you missed uh, part one, please go ahead and just pause this episode. Jump back to the previous episode. We interview uh, Jared and Ashley. And mostly the episode was dedicated to Jared's upbringing in the church, growing up in the Inland Empire and uh, experiencing a lot of sexual shame and uh, guilt within a Mormon context and also experiencing sexual abuse as a young Mormon boy of seven years old um, and uh, experiencing um, statutory rape as a 16, 17 year, teen year old Mormon boy. And instead of being supported and protected by the church, almost being blamed or marginalized or ignored uh, within a Mormon context for both of those instances of abuse in ways that um, uh, bore heavily, weighed heavily on Jared and ended up impacting his marriage to Ashley in many ways. So that's kind of what part one is about. It's an important interview, I believe, so please go back and watch it. Ashley it was kind enough to agree to come on, but she, you know, she said that she kind of wants her profile to be a little bit lower in these episodes, so we're not intentionally neglecting your story, Ashley. This is how you want it, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so that's that's what part one was about. Now part two we're going to kind of jump to what 16 17 years into your mormon marriage after you've had seven, six kids two adopted four biological kids live in the mormon dream successful business um and living in the inland empire kind of killing it from a mormon perspective <laughs> and uh and then kind of something really sad happens so i'll give kind of a bit of a content warning we are going to be talking about uh, sexual abuse within um, a Mormon context. So please take care for yourself, practice self-care, and be aware of whoever might be listening to this with you that that's going to be the subject that we discussed today. So we're going to be talking about how they dealt with discovering abuse within their ward or within their family and how it was dealt with or misdealt with, with the warden stake uh, where they live, and then how that impacted their faith journey. So that's kind of what today's going to be about. Any corrections you want to make for that introduction? Yeah. And that's uh really good. Okay. Any Anything you want to say before we just dive in? <clears throat> no, I, I think that that was a good synopsis. <laughs> okay. So how many years into your marriage should we jump to in, in terms of like where the, the, the sadder part of the story begins with your, with your children? So I guess in November, 2020, we adopted our youngest. Okay. Our daughter. Okay. Um, then, um, and that's three years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. She just moved in with us during COVID. So, so um, in January, how old was she? She was three. And so our two youngest, we did foster to adopt. Um, and so we had fostered her and she'd been living us with us since like the beginning. The very of beginning the, of COVID. Yeah. yeah that week she moved in. Mm -hmm. And so um, oh, with the foster to adopt program, like you're taking in kids uh, that have have previous lived experience and typically traumatic. Um, and so one of the things that really resonated with us when we decided that um, adoption um, 
was the right choice for our family um, was to go to uh, the foster system instead of going to, um, you know, some other methods. Um, and part of that was because we wanted to acknowledge that if, if there's help that's needed for these kids that we were going to be able to show up for them. And so that was, but we could bring them into a safe spot and we are not the only people that could do that. There's lots of people in the foster care system that can do that and show up, but that's part of the journey that we wanted to take as a family. And so that's, that's a major reason that we wanted to foster adopt instead of going another way. Um, and so from that perspective, though, we we bring in our daughter, who's our second foster adopt, who, you know, came from a traumatic background and with that intent, like giving her stability and giving her, you know, love and care and um, and watching that have benefit and effect on our lives and um you know like i think lots of times in the foster system people are like oh they're you know that kid's so lucky to come in your family okay yeah i mean they are um but we're also like it's the um it's quid pro quo right like we're so blessed to get the opportunity to bring this child into our house this is our choice right like it's not like we're doing some great act of charity with this child like we had the intention, we wanted a child and we were blessed to be able to have her. But as a part of that, we also acknowledge that a major goal for us in going through that system is taking that kid out of a situation that is dangerous or traumatic or whatnot and and providing that stability. And so... So yeah, so... We'll- We'll start into yeah. so January 2021. Um, somebody in our ward, we were having church at our house at that time in our backyard during COVID. Yeah, we for started. probably probably six to nine months. I don't know. It was, yeah. it was a little while that we had because we have a big backyard. And, and in California, well. church could not be at the church building or inside, had to be outside. And I was the elders corn president at the time. And so as we're talking about that during ward council, like where could we hold? Um, some more they're doing it outside of the church building. And so as we were setting up one morning for the chairs outside, uh, another member in our ward came up and told me, hey, I've heard that there is some sort of sexual abuse allegation or something going on between this boy in our ward who was like 12, 13 at the time <laughs> and um, a young girl who used to be in our ward. So her brother was friends with this kid. He said, "Just I just know that your daughter likes to go up to people and stuff and just be careful. Like, he's going to be here. I don't know what's going on exactly, but just uh, because he's close to us, he knows our daughter. Like, just, you know, just watch out. And so the very next day, um, one of our kids has a friend over, and this kid comes with him, which is odd because he's not friends with our kids he just came along with somebody else and I was kind of worried and um but not enough that I knew anything concrete so I just made sure they all kind of stayed outside and I kept around the little kids until well yeah and what you did is you called me yeah I right? called Jared I was like hey this kid is at our house that I just heard about yesterday right what should I do like and so like I just said okay well like you just tell the older kids uh, to stay outside and you know, that his parents need to come and get him like, cause he was not invited to our house. Um, not by us. Um, and anyway, so, um, basically once, once that happens, um, like, I tell her to, she calls or something. I don't know. Either way, his parents are going to come pick him up. And there's three other kids um, that he's kind of palling around with that came over um, at the same time to our house. And so um, I directly knew one of the other um, 
you know, the parents that um, had like in were with this kid when he came over. And so directly, I had not said anything to anybody after hearing. Well, because we didn't really know. You hear one little thing. You don't want to like spread a whole bunch of rumors of nothing. You know, we don't know what's going on. Yeah, like, we didn't. We didn't know, we know what nothing. the allegation was. We just knew that there was something to do with, with sexual abuse yeah. with this kid, and so that's all we heard. And just to keep our kid away. And so once I saw though that um, that that was the case that he was coming over with these other kids, um, I went directly over um, to their parents' house because they have little they have little kids there too. But, yeah, they've got plenty of little people. And so um, we went and I talked to him and said, hey, guys, I don't know exactly what's going on, um, but I do know that there's some allegation against this kid. um, And I feel like you guys should know because your kids are hanging around with him and you have um, toddlers in your own house. And so, like, I'm not not trying to spread gossip because I don't know what the context is for this, but I do know that there's something there. So you should be aware. And so that's where I left it. Um, Well, then the very next day I got a call from this lady who used to be on our ward for her kids. Her kids were friends with this boy. And she said, Hey, I heard that so-and-so was at your house yesterday. Like, is that true? And we're like, yes. And they're like, well, let me tell you. So her daughter had confessed, or she, he had confessed to molesting her. And that was, she used, they used to be in our ward. So this is real. And they told me that they would be keeping him home and we would keep this quiet. Like they wouldn't put him in anyone's, any harm's way. And, but so, now that I know that he's at your house, like that they're letting him go wherever they feel like, I need to start calling people. Cool. So she started calling around to people in our ward. Yeah. And so, um, from that, like the, we did get some feedback. Um, well, I will say I wasn't that concerned because he'd only been to our house like one other time. And that was in December. That was the first time he'd ever really been to our house, not church wide. So I was thinking I'll watch out for this, but like, I wasn't really concerned because he wasn't ever hanging around our house. Right. So there was one other instance that he had been to our house. Um, And so, you know, like our kids weren't close to him. Now, besides the fact that he was attending house or church at our house. Mm -hmm. And so he's just a friend of a friend. He's younger than our. Than our other son is by a year. And so. So we weren't like, we weren't thinking of it in the context of, of, hey, do we have any victims? We were just thinking like, hey, we're going to protect. But even still, we didn't know once again at that point what the context was of the the abuse that had gone on we just knew that there was something there so um over the next few days um we we did hear feedback from a few different parents and like the narrative starts coming yeah. back it's like oh that mom is just kind of crazy and don't right. believe her she's over exaggerating she's mad at the mother mom you know just blaming yeah, i mean she's just being hysterical or yeah like all the words that you can use to describe so somebody her, to describe her, them. Her daughter was like seven at the time that this came out. And he had apparently confessed. He thought he was in trouble for something else. And then when they confronted him on it, he said, I, I did. I've been molesting your daughter, basically. That, that well, no, yeah, it was to his parents. His, to his parents, yeah. Yeah. And so, and they, so they had called and, yeah, they said they would keep him at home. They didn't know exactly the extent, but that we'll keep him home and make sure nothing's going to happen. Don't call and, you know, don't call the police. Don't talk to anybody just until we, you know, figure this out. Do you feel comfortable sharing the age of the boy? He is, he was like 13 at the time. 13? Okay. So he's 15 now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And was it a Mormon family? Yes. He was in the, his dad was in the bishopric because mom was young woman's president. Oh my goodness. So it's a a semi-prominent family. Yes. For the ward. Right. Well, and he and, had served with the stake president in the bishop, our bishopric right before that. So yes, yes, it was. So he was in his second bishopric in a row, and for a total of like nine or ten years in a row. I mean, it was it was a long time. And she'd been young woman's president for a long time too. Right. And so, um, so you know, we'll in a little bit we'll talk about how that, that was pa- power imbalance is not good. That was problematic <laughs> as well. But, um, so we start hearing this feedback and without, without 
any further context because we're not trying to dig in and be like, oh, yeah, okay. we would just we'd hear things, but we didn't dig into it because it's not we don't we don't really hang out with that family really either one of those families, right? But then the first week, <clears throat> so the first week of March or the last week of February, we actually took our daughter to be sealed in the temple. And we got a lot of, we were trying to get our recommend interviews because we had to do it for the whole family to be there. And um, the bishopric and the bishop and stake president kind of kept pushing it off. Like they were supposed to come to our house to do it. And then they just didn't show up or they'd be like, oh, I'm busy. I can't come. And so finally, like the day of, I think, the stake president finally called us and was just like, hey, I'm just going to sign these and email to you. Like he didn't want to talk to us. Which wasn't that weird. He's a, you know, the busy guy, whatever, like, and then it turns out the next week we got a call from the abuser's parents. Right. And so we've, we've got a, an event going on like at our house in like 30 minutes or whatever from the time that I'm talking, um, to this, uh, the dad. to the dad of the abuser. And, uh, he calls me up and he's like, Hey, um, I've got some uh, hard information to tell you. And it's like, okay, you know, now to be fair, I'm the elder scorn president and he's the first counselor, the Bishop Rick. And so I don't have really any context like for it what it would be. Things, yeah. And so he's like, um, I just uh, wanted to call and tell you that I, um, that my son has confessed um, to inappropriately, touching your daughter um over her clothes on her vagina like that specifically and he said in the in our theater room in, in your theater room and so and like, it would have been that one time that he was there that the first time he was ever at our house like december yeah i mean the first time that he was at our house to hang out yeah right? before like, we even knew anything right and so that being said like i yeah, well, he was very insistent that we hurry up and get this over with because he needed to repent and get back to taking the sacrament. Yeah, so, I mean, the... That's the first, the first conversation we had with his dad. Hmm. So the context of that conversation was like, look, here's what my son did. Is like, and this has been so difficult. Like, uh, I'm sure that you've heard about this, but, you know, there, there's another family... Um, that is spreading misinformation and lies about what has happened to their child. And we're just trying to do whatever we can to help our son move past this. And so that he can go through the repentance process and like, you know, move on with life or something like that to the, you know, and so. Um, and we were first just like kind of frozen for like a, a day probably like a whole day well part part of the thing though that he said to me in that conversation because this was just on the phone with me and i'm downloading it to ashley really the next day um we chatted about it for a minute afterwards um but like he's like you know these people are supposed to be our friends like and they're considering suing us and like this is really difficult on my wife and I, and it's been so hard and we're just trying to do the right thing. Like kind of this whole narrative. Like really setting us up to just be like, okay. So is it, they're acknowledging that there are other victims yes. besides right. you, right. but when disclosing the abuse of your own child, they're already trying to kind of position themselves as victims. That's right. right. Yes. Is that right? Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, not right, even right from the beginning. And not even a little bit like, you know, he he's just so concerned about making sure um, that and that first of all, that we know um, that they're concerned about repentance. Right. Like, why? Why the hell are you talking to me about repentance at all mm -hmm. in this Especially conversation? Not on this first conversation. Like, yeah. this is insanity. <laughs> right. Right. And so. But, but wait, you believe in repentance. You At this point, you believe in the atonement. Sure. You believe in repentance. So. For those who have no idea the context or can't understand, why is that annoying to you at the time? Well, we just told us that your kid, like, yeah. abused our kid. That's, like, the last thing that we were even, like, right. we don't care about your kid. Like, Yeah, the focus is not your kid. The yeah, focus is right. the fact that you just told me that my child was molested. Yeah. 
Like, right. and by your kid who did it, that confessed. Like, who's a lot older than our kid. Our kid was three. Yeah. So 10 years, 10, yeah. 10 years, years older. Old. Yeah. Right. Like this isn't like. And he confessed to this. And that's, I mean, it wasn't like we caught anybody or we're accusing anybody. Like this was right. the confession. No and that's, and, that and they gave us probably the very least information they could have given us. Oh, for sure. So, and, I mean, they're trying to paint it in as positive a context as they can. And so the other thing um, that he says is he's like, um, you know, he he's really sorry about it. And, you know, we've talked to a counselor and they've said that this is, this is, uh, off, this Very often normal. happens during puberty. Like, like he's painting this picture for me. Like he's just a kid who just, oh, going through puberty. I'm just gonna, you know, it's yeah, totally just, normal. Just some curious kid who's exploring sexuality kind of thought process. And it's like, so at that point, my first response, like my guilt, shame ridden response is like, oh my gosh, yeah, that's so hard. Like, that's how I showed up in that conversation. I'm like, oh yeah, man, this must be hard for you. Like I'm, I literally said to him, I'm not kidding you. I said to him, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Like, I was sorry to hear that his, yes, I was sorry to hear that, right? But for... You know, it was so my my mentality around that at that point was it was screwed up, right? Like my first thought is to have empathy for the concerns and things that he's expressing about how hard this is on him and his family, um, without taking really any um time to be like, hey, um, buddy, we got a problem here. Like, when he also was like, I just want us to be good friends. Like, I know we're such good friends. It's like, we're not, we're, not, you guys. we're not friends. <laughs> we're well, well. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing is, you know, we were talking about how you respond, how people respond to traumatic situations. And it's fight, flight, freeze, fawn. And fawn is like what you're describing. It's not something we choose. It's not like a conscious choice how you show up in situations that are really shocking. And I can only imagine for you personally too what was going on for you hearing that. And so that is what fawn looks like. And it's, it is valid. It is a valid traumatic response based on survival and staying kind of safe. You also kind of saw things it feels like modeled. Oh, for that sure. way for too. Sure. So anyway, but continue on. Yes, yeah, on, so the, on the behalf so he's kind of, of trying to butter you up, manipulate, yeah. work you. Yes. For sure. as he's disclosing to you that your yeah. child would be sexually sure. abused so talk, by his son. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Talking to me about how hard this was for them. Yeah, right. Like, and, and this so, has to be triggering for you, given your story exactly. of abuse. This has all the same ingredients of the abuse that you described earlier. Well. You know, it's it's funny because initially, like my first response um, was wasn't that. You know, like I wasn't necessarily thinking in that vein. I was like, oh yeah, I mean, I'm sure this is hard. Like this is not an enviable position that this family is in, and so and that's true. Well, but for sure, it shouldn't be the main focus. But but the point, like as he's calling to tell me about the misinformation that's out there. Trying to, trying to really slander the first victims for mom sure and family no they absolutely were absolutely were slandering and diminishing um you know the abuse and yeah. so so they it's that and then it's like hey you know we want to remain friends like you know we love you and your family so much and i'm gonna be frank like i like a lot of people these were not on the list of people that i actually liked yeah. I mean, like, they were not word. They were casual acquaintances at church, but we didn't. We they were not friends. With them. We, well, not only were we not friends with them, but like in a ward ward council context, like if you were to ask the other people that in, were in ward council, like I'm a guy that's willing to speak up and say the thing that's not like popular, um, and so we would go through ward council, and oftentimes, um, you know, him and his wife would she would bring up an issue that's like really weird and inappropriate or odd, like very boundaryless kind of stuff. And I'd be like, no, that doesn't make sense. Why would we do that? Mm -hmm. You know? And so 
we were often opponents on opposite sides. And her of the husband's issue. in the bishopric, so he just backs her up, and then no one wants to say anything. For sure, and so, but I, I was always willing to kind of like have it out, and probably more so than probably most people in the room preferred. And w- whatever, like that's the point of ward council, in my perspective, is like we have to hear um, different sides of the issues to make good decisions. But there were multiple safety concerns like to do with activities that they would want to hold. Um, Like they specifically um, would be pressury to people um, to... To do unsafe like youth activities. Or to violate church policy. Or like not have more than, you know, having youth drive with leaders by themselves. So she was like kind of boundary. Yeah, she would boundary pressure, issues maybe. Yeah, she would pressure her young women's counselors to like drive girls alone when they would be like, no, I'm not, we're not allowed to do that. Got she it. would right. pressure them and be like, what would Jesus do? Like he would want everyone to come to the activity, blah, blah, blah. Right. Interesting. Yeah. And so, you know, she would, she would text the girls individually and lots of things like that, that were, there were boundary issues with. And so we never got along like, Um, and I'm not going to say like we hated them, but we just, we weren't buddies. Like, and so when he said that to me, I recognized that as a manipulation tactic right away. I knew what he was doing. Um, I knew that he was being insincere when he talked about how much they loved us and like that they wanted to remain friends. And like, um, I go out to dinner with my friends like every week, right? How many times have we gone out to dinner? Uh, none times. That's how many. And so, and so we, not your favorite family no, in the world. No. Even before this. And so yes. buttering us up and pretending like, yeah, uh, like this was something that they're trying to preserve our relationship. I knew that was BS, like from the outset. And so mm-hmm. I, I did talk to Ashley about it right before we had, our we had like, of, yeah, 12 people coming over for some fun. Yeah. It was for our beach house uh, thing. Uh, anyway, it's fun times. Um, so probably for the the whole next day, like we were still kind of. Well, I, I okay. do want to address the the beach house meeting that we had that night because the, our stake president, um, we do mutually own the property with him at the time. At the, the time, stake president at the time, yeah. Well, yeah, thing. He, yeah, we still own the property with him, but um, he was at this meeting that we were having at our house to go over how we were handling this beach house that we had bought together. Um, and so he hung out with us that night, the whole night and sat in the spa with us after like everybody left for like, I don't know, a couple hours or something like that. And so we hung out and talked. And for, for the never Mormons, a stake president, imagine priests or, uh, pastors that lead a congregation and then imagine like eight to 10, congregations a stake president would be the catholic equivalent to like the leader of a diocese Mm -hmm. it would be the leader of of 10 congregations so a very a very senior high-ranking influential and important spiritual leader in the community he lived down a lot of power he lived down the street from our house jared did a lot of business with him so he was close-ish yeah with us And so he's sitting in her spa hanging out with us the night that we found out that we found out about this. And but he was there at our house till like 1130 or something. It was late. So then when he left, we just went to sleep. Um, But at the time we were sitting in the spa with him, he knew about all of this and had known about it for a while. So he knew about our daughter. Um, He knew about multiple other victims. you know, and we're just well, yeah. Like, they knew they knew about it when we were getting our telephone tumble recommend interviews the week before, and they didn't so say anything. It was is weird to look back. They after knew your that. kid had been abused. Yeah. Yes, before you did. Yes, but didn't tell you. We immediately. This Correct. kid sat in front of us at sacrament meeting after the bishop knew, and we did not know. Like he was sitting right in front of our daughter for a week or two, and they had known about it, and they had never told us. We found out about that later after the police talked to us when we found out more of a timeline when they were notified. Ooh. And so, so yeah, the next day was Saturday. And that night I feel like we were really kind of like starting to like let it sink in. And I was thinking if there was already like these two victims, like there's probably more in our ward. And so my first thought was one of my friends who lived down the street from them. 
And I messaged her on Facebook and I was like, hey, have you heard about this thing with this kid? And she was like, yes, like dot, dot, dot. And I was like, we just got a call about our daughter. And she's like, okay, let's, it was like midnight. She's like, can I call you? And they had gotten the same call about their three-year-old from the parents. And so wait, so what's the family count now of families? That's three kids, three families so far. So right in this part of the story, there's three families now that have kids that are victims. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then the next day was Sunday. And I was, I was at that point starting to get kind of mad. And I was like, we, this kid can't be at church with all these kids. So he's at least our kid and their other, the second mm-hmm. three-year-old. Like he shouldn't be at church where everyone can see him. Like mm-hmm. that's not fair. And so Jared had called the bishop, I think, mm-hmm. and said, hey, like expressing that concern. Like if we know he has victims right now, can you have him stay home? And we were still only half in-person sacrament meeting, half Zoom. So it wouldn't have been a big deal to have him not come to church. Like, wouldn't it have been like, oh, that family's not here. That's super weird. Like, it wouldn't have been weird. Mm -hmm. We're just barely, like, we had just come back to church, like, in person. Yeah, so that conversation happened at 8 a.m. Like With the bishop. Yeah. With the bishop. Let's back up. So the did the stake president express condolences? Well, he didn't, we didn't, hadn't talked to him yet. Okay, Jared so you just, jacuzzi yeah. with him, yeah. but you didn't bring it up to him, and he didn't bring it up to yeah, you. Yeah, because we didn't really think about that, I feel like. You were just point. saying kind of in retrospect, yeah. what you learned was he knew yeah. that yes. night. So you're jacuzzi with him while he knows yeah. your child yeah. had been abused, and he doesn't bring it up, even while you're jacuzzi right. with him. Right. And that's so, the same day you learned yeah. about it. So Sunday morning, right. Jared had called our bishop to say, hey, like we found this out. They called us. Like, do you know about this? And he obviously... He did know. Well, the way that he handled that conversation, though, is he's like, well, I I can't tell you, like, what is it that you... What are you talking about? What are you talking about? And then I said, and then I told him specifics. Because he didn't want to be the one to tell us, like, we didn't know all the information. He's trying to, he's trying to obey the church's clergy privilege right yeah penitent privilege Penitent privilege he's Mm -hmm. basically saying if something's been confessed to me in a church or religious context i have to keep it confidential but if we say it not not just then he can not just parents of victims but from the police i can't disclose to anybody right correct Mm -hmm. right that's what he's thinking yeah so that's that's what he said to me and And he said yeah i can't then i told him what i knew And about, we knew about the other victim. And knew about the other victims. And like, he's like, um, he's like, well, yes. And I was like, well, you need to keep this kid home from church. Like, and church was starting in like an hour. Was there a why didn't you tell me moment? Um, I don't remember. I I, guess we're not trained to be confrontational with authority. Yeah. I mean, I, there was like, the next I, day, a couple of days later, we did get okay. we did get into that. So we'll, it sounds moment, like right now you were more you're just about, trying to create a safe situation right. for yes. people. Yes, and so that because we know that, that there's my point. three victims so far too that still attend that ward that they. And I said, in. now that we know that there are multiple victims, this cannot happen. Like he cannot attend church in our ward. And they right. were like, "Nope, we can't do that." Yeah, well, so what he said is like, "Well, I cannot prohibit anyone from coming to church," which is not true. And so I said, Bishop, you know that that is not true. And he said, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, you know what a persona non grata is. And the way that I know that you know that is because one was served like a couple years ago or 18 months ago or whatever for somebody that had threatened his safety that told him they were going to beat him up. The Bishop's safety. Right. And so like, in my mind, I'm looking at this guy, I'm like, okay, right. So you're going to do persona non grata for some guy that you're afraid of physically. So it was like a, yeah, a homeless guy or something. Like that. Uh, yeah. Anyway, it's, a, it's just a weird situation. But the bottom line is like um, he, he had that. And then I was the elders corn president. And so he had us post uh, people to stand watch on both sets of doors. Like a security. Like that you could enter in. Like he had elders corn run security 
um, ever since that happened for like the last two years. Yeah. And I was in charge of making sure that we had security there uh, in case this guy were to come in the building or any other threat. Like so it he just, knows how to protect the members when he wants to. Yes. Uh, to protect a Perhaps. member, right? <laughs> yeah. Like to protect him freaking himself. Self, right now, look, I mean, you know, himself, there, yeah. there was other, um, there were other stuff like, other things being used to sell that as well. Like there's shootings and other things like that that have happened. I'm like, dude, honestly, like, you know, that this is the case, you know, that you can tell anybody that you want not to come. It's like, but I don't freaking care. Like if you are not going to keep him home, then I am going to call every family that I am aware of that has children. Well, you escalate the- to the like president first. And he oh. also said the same thing. That, that is but they're true. not going to do, we're, we're going to do anything. And I just have to say, mm. uh, th- this reminds me of uh, some other interviews we've done on, on Mormon Stories podcast. Um, but, but if we're thinking about the power dynamics here, the bishop, you know, this is the bishop's counselor. So the bishop chooses two counselors to be his right hand men, so to speak, to help him run the ward. Usually he's going to pick the people he likes the most. He would have handpicked the father in this family to be one of his two yes. consiglieries, so to speak. Yep. So he's going to, there's a conflict of interest. Yes. yes. Because and that's we, his neighbor as well. What? It's his neighbor as well. Yeah. Lives down the street, yeah. And, and it also reflects on his, within Mormonism, we have this perception of a spirit of discernment that God blesses our leaders with the wisdom of God to make choices like who gets what calling or position within the church. So it not only condemns his friend who he's going to try and protect, it it Im- implicates him as having made a bad choice by choosing a counselor whose son is going to run around and, and abuse kids. So like in all these different ways, your bishop had a conflict of interest yes, to definitely. not look after yes. the best interests of you or other kid, vulnerable people in the ward but instead to protect his counselor himself and kind of like to minimize disruption in the congregation or the ward that he was in charge of. Plus whatever pressures the state president and Kurt McConkey, the church's law firm yes. are going to end up applying to him, which I want to hear about now. <laughs> and, and can we just say, this is so familiar to part one. Yes. yes. Like How so? this happened directly this yeah. situation in part one, all yeah. these things were showing up, you know, when you were in those situations. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, and it's interesting. If they would have just kept him home right away, the church would have had a lot less visibility in this. They could have kept this a lot quieter and then yeah. it ends up having to be blown up. Yeah. Well, in well, so Jared did call all the parents in the ward before church and there was enough pressure that they did not end up bringing their son that day. But the the other interesting part of this, and this is important to understand, is that the person that I escalated to was the state president, um, who also said a similar thing. Hmm. Um, but the state president, prior to being the state president, was our bishop, or the bishop of this ward. And his counselor... Was that kid's dad Was again. that kid's dad and had been his counselor for his whole tenure as a bishop, Rick. So there's a lot of conflicts. So it's kind of a, a good, old boy, yes, good, old, yes. good old boys club yep. where the men are going to protect each other and those friendships and relationships. Yeah. And, and, you know, another piece to that, which there's more to go back to on this, but for the last like 12 or 13 years, they had been having monthly Sunday dinners where the bishop and state president and this family were in attendance. Uh, like, so they hung out with these few families and some other families. They had dinner clubs with all their families and I for see. years. So they're all very close. Socially connected as yeah, well. Yeah, for like yeah. 11 or 13 mm-hmm. years or something like that. But a long time that they're very intimately So you um, ruin, you other. throw someone under the bus. It's, they don't want to make their friends mad and cause disruption and... The, you know, I think for the family of the abuser, that one of the worst, worst things that I'm sure that they thought of right away um, was that our family specifically was one of the was one of the families of the victim, because. Um, we're we're not kind of. I think they knew we would. I think we were probably the ones they were most scared to tell. 
Because they knew we wouldn't be quiet. Yeah, because we wouldn't. They just. I feel like they figured we wouldn't shut up, and they were right. We we weren't going to shut up, Mm -hmm. and so, um, so you know, we're told that he they can't tell us that he can't attend. Like, and then finally, um, they come back to or talk to us after church, and they're like, "Well, based off of the fact that you guys were so concerned, (laughs) um, then." Like the family decided that he wouldn't home. come. You know, I told them that it would probably be best if he didn't attend. And so I was like, well, that's fine. Like, but this is not out of their grace. Like this will be mandated. Like I'm not, it's not going to be their decision as to whether or not he comes back to church. Um, that's not their privilege, mm-hmm. you know? And so I, you know, that, that is a debate now, um, from that time forward for about four yeah, or five if, months. If he's going to be allowed to come back or not, we had to keep, you know, they kept kind of trying to negotiate with us on certain things. And it was like, no, this is not. Right. There not is no scenario that my kid is going to show up every week and face his abuser. Whether or not she realizes it. Right. She was and so, or not. Um, that was the other thing that he did say to me in the first conversation, um, which was an important thing that he repeated and she repeated multiple times over and over. And, and in emails is, and stuff, yeah. Yeah, and that is that your, um, fortunately, your daughter is so young, she's probably never going to remember any of this. And they, they had told the other victim's family, too, that if your three-year-old hasn't shown any, like, symptoms of being abused by now, then they're, they're fine. So they're basically, for their own self-interest and biases, trying to minimize whatever impact there may or may not have been to your daughter. Yeah. And I was going to say in all these early deliberations, first of all, they didn't tell you, you had to, you had to kind of find out and then confront them. They're immediately not wanting to give consequences to the, to the abuser and they're not wanting to protect the rest of the ward. How much did they go? How do we help your daughter? How do we provide support to your daughter? How do we make sure is she okay? None. How do we no. make sure no one she's asked, okay? No one asked about her at all. What? No one asked anything about her. No. I no mean, one cared. At all. Honestly, no one cared. They only cared about him. Yeah, they're they're actually from everybody. I, that that's honestly, I even I, from people that we told about in the ward, like it was all about oh what we don't want to smear his bat his name, right. like the, even it, though when Jared called and talked to lots of those families they all were immediately kind of concerned because he plays hide and sink and wrestling at church with all the kids in the ward up to that point. So they all were slightly concerned, like at the very beginning, like, Oh, wait a minute. Like, like that is concerning. Yeah. I mean, and one of the things, a phrase that they used multiple times is like, why do we have to drag his name through the mud? Like they, they said that. And so that was that was a strong narrative from the beginning, but I didn't even, I, I honestly until right now I didn't think that nobody, like none of them said, "Hey, how is she doing? How mm-hmm. is your daughter?" Like, I mean, like that just was not ever a concern, like for them, you know. It was all about getting him help. It it was, and and to make sure everyone was quiet. So. So yeah, so Monday, the day after that day, we had, I was very, I was probably the loudest one. Um, we got on a Zoom meeting with all of the victims, parents, sick president and bishop. And I think your dad was on there to kind of help. He knows, he knows everybody just to, and he was very concerned. I mean, this is his, his grandchild, but he's still, you know, he's still trying to do the churchy way to get things done. And like, I probably and yelled. He said he'd been in the stake presidency. Yeah, he knew all these people. And he'd like, been a bishop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Of that ward, I guess. Mm-hmm. And it, we, it was, you know, questions like they, they really wouldn't tell us anything. They wanted to have this like informational meeting for us, but we'd ask them questions. And they're like, oh, I can't really answer that. I can't tell you when I found out. I can't tell you what they told me. And I was so mad. I was probably yelling more than. Necessary, but and I was like, you guys knew about this. Like we sat behind this kid. You could had you had all of us in view of your stand. Like, just what are you guys gonna do about this? And my big thing was I really wanted them to call the police, make a report. 
It had been reported by the victim's family eventually, the first victim. And we, I mean, we had called just to make a report, even though I knew about it. And I really wanted them, I wanted them to make a point to call and make a report. Even if it wasn't necessary, like at this point, like they already knew about it. I'm like, just make a call for me. Like, make me feel good. So what they told us on that Zoom and then multiple times afterwards. Yeah, I texted for a couple of weeks afterwards. I'm like, you guys want to do it? Do it. Just, just prove to me that you'll do something right. And so what they told us is that they had been instructed by the church helpline. Nobody wants to say church legal, but that's like, let's be very clear that the church helpline is Kirtan McConkie. That is church legal. Mm -hmm. You are calling the church's attorneys as a bishop to say, hey, what should we do here? You're not saying, what should we do to help the victim? You're not saying, mm -hmm. what should we do to help the victim's families? Like, how do we help people emotionally process this? Like, you're saying, what is it that we need to disclose? So then after, a, I mean, nothing really happened at that meeting, really. I mean, they just blew us off. But so what they told us, though, in that meeting is that they had been instructed that they did not need to report, yeah. like that they were not required to do that. And so to the police. Right. Correct. And the so Kurt McConkie, the church's law firm, told the stake president and bishop yeah. to tell the family and probably all the parents of all the victims, you don't have to report this. And probably that translates to please don't report this. Right. I'm sure. Now, I mean, what both the state president and bishop did say multiple times is they're like, you guys can um, and should do whatever you feel is right. So they did they say did, that. Yeah. Um, but we cannot, like, we can't do anything like we are not allowed to do that. And so. And then your dad called Kurt McConkie and they basically said, well, we can't tell you what we told them in this particular case, but I'll tell you what we tell all the bishops and that's what they should report. It's mandated by law. Uh, that's what Kieran McConkie told my dad. That's what they told me. Um, and but who knows who's more likely to tell the truth? I guess right. right? I mean, <laughs> because I'm not afraid to call and talk to an attorney's office. Like that's fine. So like I just call Kieran McConkie and hear it directly from them. And I talked to um, I don't know what his first name is, but it's, I talked to a McConkie. So he's some sort of, I'm assuming, a partner of the law firm because McConkey is on the building. So, um, but when I talk to him, he's like, no, that is absolutely not true. We do not p tell people not to report. We tell them to obey all the laws. And, and California so, is a state where you are supposed to, they're mandated reporters, clergy. Are. Right. And so... Including Mormon LDS yes. clergy. Yeah. Correct. And so that, when... We had multiple conversations over a decent period of time, you know, like, I don't know, six, eight weeks, whatever, with the bishop and stake president, where they kept saying, no, that's not what they are telling us. Like, and it was probably like a month, like a month after that. I was getting, we found out that there was another victim, a sibling of one of the other victims that he confessed to to the police. Yep. And so I had, it was just really frustrating because they kept trying to like have him come back to church and all this stuff. And so I had posted on Facebook, like, you know, there's a little synopsis of what had happened and we'd found out and that like the local law enforcement were super, like so helpful. Like they came up right away. They took our report. Like they did what they could and they're, you know, what you can for a three-year-old victim. But like our local church leaders aren't doing anything. They won't report. So like, wait, I'm confused. So if California is a mandatory reporting state, <laughs> why didn't your stake president and bishop report? Well, so their reasoning was that it had already been reported. So the first victim had gone to LDS Family Services for some counseling, and she reported it. But and that's that, what they're that's what they're considering the church reporting it. But Wait, they, the, the, they, they reported to the therapist? No, yeah. Or to so, child so, of... So the, the therapist... Who then reported to the child... The, and, the child, police or CPS. Probably CPS, not the police. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so, so Okay, so... So the that, church leaders are counting that. 
So the church leaders, the Mormon church leaders in California are counting a report to a Child and Protective Services from a therapist as sufficient such that they wouldn't need to report to, to the police. Yes. And so it's like 70 some odd days that they didn't report. And I, I had posted that on social media and got a lot, a lot of good. I mean, people were like, what? Like, how is this possible? And like, and then we had gone out of town the next week. And when I, we had gotten off our airplane, I get, I see this email, this mass email that goes to everybody in our ward, like, you know, like 500 people, everybody that's on the ward list that hasn't even been to church in years, everybody talking about how there was, there's something going on. There's lies going on on social media. It's like in response to what I had posted. And so instead of, you know, a few people Whoa, knowing. Wait, so what did you post? Just about how they hadn't reported and just how. We had better treatment from, from the, the government. government. Like, and so this email was in a direct response to what I had posted. Okay. And about how there's lies going around social media. But it was from the area authority. Yes. Yeah. So you post on social media that the church isn't handling this abuse right. Right. And an area authority... Emails everybody in the ward. Who, some people had never been to church and hadn't been to church in years. So now instead of a few people knowing, everybody in the ward now knows about this. Right. In the context of lies. Though. Yes. <laughs> right, right. I mean, it was very twisted, mm. trying to half tell the truth. Okay. And so we, I, we were so mad. And we were on vacation, but we were going to figure this out. And Jared calls the guy up and was like, you need to retract this. Like, you're making, like, my wife sound like sh and all the victims' families, like, that they're lying. But you guys are are lying here. Like, yeah. and so we went back and forth and, and like. So a, he, a Mormon area authority yeah. basically calls you a liar. An email to everybody in the ward. Yep. In an email to everyone in the ward. Yeah. Hmm. What was that like? It was unbelievable. Like, I don't <laughs> I mean, this is a church you believe in, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I'm like, Jared, we have to fix this. Like, this is... So well, Jared does all that dirty work. So he called them up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, I mean, I call up the area president, and I have a pretty frank conversation. I'm like, look, you have two options here. One, um, we are going to reply all to this email. They, they did it where you can reply all to everybody instead of a C... What do you call that? BCC. So there, he doesn't know how to use his email, which is kind of funny in this context. Because you were able to reply all. <laughs> and we said we would give you 24 hours to send out a new one. The clock is ticking. In yeah. an email? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and so I just, I, I got well, on the turned, phone. Yeah. It turns out though, the other victim's family, the other dad, he was not so nice. And he emailed everybody back and said, this was not true. Your leaders are lying to you. So this is all goes, the reply all goes to back to all the ward members. So there's this massive ward <laughs> And then the state president replies chain. like, oh, I'm so sorry you feel that way, you know, <laughs> back to everybody. And it was like, wow. They, they finally did I'm send out. I'm sorry you feel that yeah. way? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I mean, look, the, the whole narrative around, um, around the responses that come back from the state president and the bishop is always oh, not to say that they were wrong or that what you were saying is true. Right, so I'm sorry that this is how you are interpreting this, or I'm sorry Correct. that you feel like that. Right. Not, I'm sorry this happened. Not, I'm sorry we made this mistake. Wow. But I, I'm sorry that you feel like this was a mistake. Yeah. But eventually they did send out an email that was close enough. It was a week retract. We were on vacation and we were like, that's, uh, that's good enough. For now, I guess, right? Like, but basically, what the email had said is that, you know, Ashley's uh, post, they didn't use Ashley's name, but that Ashley's post was uh, incorrect, that they had reported properly, and that they were doing everything that they could to protect the families um, and that kind of thing. And so the reality is, they had not reported. So the point was, like, they reported not at all themselves. Like the bishop, the state president did not report. So that's important to note because they did eventually. Because I mean, when but was not that? at this point. Not by that point yet. So, no. but the point to that report, one of the things that is important in reporting um, is 
being able to report from your perspective and what was told to you, because different things are going to be told to different Because the parents people. are going to report different things than what the bishop who heard the confession is going to report. Yes. Like, and the dad was a mandated reporter from his setting as a school principal. Um, and so he goes in to report, and then they tell him at the school or at the at CPS, like, hey, since this is your child, you don't have to report it. And he's like, well, you know, I feel like I should. Now, in my perspective, like, I didn't start out this way, but now in my perspective, um, I believe that if your report is the softest report that you can yeah, you, give, you lead the narrative. You lead the narrative. And so I absolutely believe that that was the intent there. And maybe it was all pure intent. It doesn't really matter to me because at the end of the day, Bishop and stake president have an obligation to report. Neither of them had. They just are telling us that Karen and McConkie are saying, no, you do not report. You cannot report. It's already been reported. Well, the problem with that is what actually we ended up finding out over time is that the report that they're referencing is this therapist. Which well, does not count as a church leader. Well, Any therapist has Neither to. here nor right. there. Because the point to that is this therapist had talked to the first victim only. Right. And so they never reported for the rest right, of our daughter exactly. or the other ones. So, Pattern. But so a few weeks later, though, our then nine-year-old daughter, she came to me and she said, hey, because we had asked her, because she's the next oldest who maybe could have been around him at this time. She says, hey, you know that that kid, you know, whatever was going on. She's like, at the ward, we had a ward Christmas party outside the church building. And she's like, he was trying to come up and like touch me and my friend, but we scared him off. And it was like super weird. And I was like, what? Like, <laughs> and so right away, and I, I texted the stake president and Bishop on my, my one text thread just to give them like, because their whole point is that none of this abuse happened at church. Like they were really trying to hammer that down. We're not really responsible. Nothing happened at church. And I'm like, this was at a church event, at a church building. There were lots of other kids there. And my daughter's telling me this. And so right away, they're kind of scared. So they call CPS the next day to report that, what I told them, because they got a little got a little nervous. But is Well, part of the questionnaire is, did the abuse happen at church? The church right. becomes more liable right. at that point. So we keep going through to being sued, right. which yes. has nothing to do with the welfare no. right. of the victims or the safety of the members. It's covering the church's tail legally. Right. Yeah. Right? So I want to be very clear on this. The church's policies are set up for one purpose only. And that is to protect the church. Like what we found out is we started going through this process and hearing other people's stories because when they heard our story, people started messaging We got messaging lots us. of messages and calls like, hey, like I, this happened to me when I was younger and no one did anything about it. Like it was. I mean. And so as, as we start going down the rabbit hole on how the church deals with this, we find out that this is how they always deal with it. Like this is not an anomaly. This is the program. This is the system. And so from that perspective, like as we go back and forth with the church leaders, I've talked to Kirtan and McConkie a couple times. Um, well, and then there ends up being another victim of a, a sibling, like another sibling of one of the victims. Like six. I mean, the body counts like six. So there's six Something at this at that time. point, yeah. And in the meantime, like we, we figure out that the case is that um, this counselor was supposed to have been the one that reported. And then we hammer home the point even harder. Like, hey, still no one has reported for, for our daughter. At least our daughter and the other three-year-old. So the last conversation that the bishop has with me on that, um, he calls and talks to Kieran McConkie again. In the, this was the sick and twisted reality is the last conversation that he has with them. He's like, look, they are giving us a lot of pressure. And we... Like, we are giving them pressure. He's calling and complaining about us. Like, we're getting a lot of pressure. What can we do to, like, stop? And he's this? like, "Can how can we report? And he's like, well, you can report. You just don't have to report. You're not required to. So they could have just done it all along. They just 
weren't telling them they had to. And so when I talked to the bishop about this after he called and reported, um, he's like, the, the messaging that he received um, was when he, he called. No, when he called in, they used a simple phrase and they said, you cannot report. And so the way that he took that was you are not allowed to report when they said you cannot report. What they actually were saying is you can not report. Like it's your option to not report. And so, but I feel like, like after talking to him, that I feel like he was manipulated by the church legal. Like, I feel like he, I, I do and the think, state president. yes, uh, the, I, I yeah. do believe that the state president did not want him to report. Um, but I do think that in general, like he wanted to do right um, by what he's supposed to do. And I, and so I do think that he wanted to report because he was getting pressure from us, but he felt like he couldn't. And once he asked the question kind of in the right way, that's when he got the answer that he needed. And then he reported because it wasn't, there was no sweat for him to report like in, at that point, right? Like, After, everyone, everything had been reported like zillion yeah. times. It's just him doing the bare minimum at this point, I guess, to right. make us feel good. So how much time between the bishop's knowledge of the first abuse and him actually reporting. Was it 73 or 79 days? It was a lot. It was, long it was 70 time. some odd days. So three months, almost three months. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And only after a courageous a lot of family or yeah. several families pressured continually for yeah. two to three and months. I will say after that email went out, we were still on vacation. They held, what is it, like a forum or a... A meeting? At like a second hour meeting. Uh, or no, I guess it was like after church. So if you wanted to stay for it, you could. And we we were not there. We were out of town. And I was like, should we get back for that? Like, I want to make sure we're not getting railroaded in this meeting. Um, but my parents were there and his parents were there and my siblings. And they, yeah. they were doing like a kind of like a rundown because that email went out and they had so many calls. Like, what's going on? Like people who had no idea. And so they did like kind of a quick like hmm, synopsis and, you know, apology. And the bishop did even apologize to the congregation. Like, I'm so sorry that we had activities at the Jones house and I didn't tell them. And so it's actually caused a lot more problems in the ward because now everybody knows that the leadership did the wrong thing with. And like, you know, our parents and siblings got up and asked like really pointed questions. And we appreciate all of that, but it was just, it's really odd, really odd. One, one thing that I'll also rewind to is in the second week after this had gone down, um, we weren't getting responses that we wanted from our bishop or state president. And so we wanted to escalate that. And so the area authority came and met with us. Oh, yes. And the other victim, uh, one of the other victims. And the same dude who wrote the email. Yes. Yes. A we couple had, weeks later. Yeah, because yeah. he wanted to come meet with us. And, and so as he meets with us, um, he goes through the process of telling us that he understands and telling us that his own daughter had been sexually abused. But they never told her. She found out like when she was on her mission or right before her mission. So mm -hmm. he's in like the, the guy who abused her was like in their ward the whole time after that still. And so she had to see him and he had to see, see him, but he forgave and... It took him a while to forgive, to but he was and so mad. Do not see this guy walking around church. So sympathetic, but still the story is like, that's a terrible story. Like, Yeah, so the, the story actually was like, this happened to my family, and we smashed it down and pretended like it didn't happen. And, and then she found out later. But She found out later, and we were able to tell her, sorry? So I, it was, she was trying to like be sympathetic towards us, trying to like endear himself towards us. I mean, it... it Felt, fell short, but he's like, I'm going to try to make things better. I'm going to, he did ask at that time, like the church will pay for counseling for your kids. If you guys want, and you know, he, it was, it was a very sincere seeming like meeting, but still that story was unsettling, but you know, we appreciated it at the time for somebody at least pretending to empathize with us. Well, that for that day, right? we're like, oh, like maybe it's going to be okay. Yeah. At that moment, it pacified us somewhat, but then afterwards processing it, we're like, um, no, he actually did the exact horrible, crappy thing that he shouldn't have done. 
which is not tell his daughter about what had gone on. Um, he really did nothing to this person. They didn't go to jail. Like nothing happened to them. And but he's showing he's virtue signaling to us that he that, did this. He forgave. That he was and, in, and it was about the forgiveness of the perpetrator. And it wasn't about his daughter at all. Uh huh. And so, like the other family that was there with us, um, going through this meeting, like they they downloaded this differently, and they were pissed. Right. Well, after and the this next meeting. week was ward conference, where you have to like raise your hand and like sustain. You know, they go through the bishop, all the auxiliary leaders, and I I purposefully. Looked at the stake president. I, I didn't raise my hand for either one, but they were totally watching me because he came to talk to me afterwards. But the other victim's parents, they raised their hand in opposition and they got a lot of crap from the ward. Well, and the stake president's wife um, was in the front. Um, she was crying. Kind she, everyone felt so bad for her yeah, that her she, husband's getting treated like this. And... Right. When she saw, like, she saw that and started bawling. That, that somebody was objecting um, to her husband, you know, as the stake president. And so, like, that was... Mm. Which is was, interesting because her kids still hung out with this kid and her husband never told her about this kid. So her kids have been playing, having dinner groups with this kid and he never told his wife. I found, she told me that later, he never told her. So this, is why the her, church, yeah. this is why the church keeps this all quiet because they don't want members losing faith in the leadership and certainly not in, in the church itself. So that's one of the reasons they keep it quiet, right? Yeah, for sure. Because everything can unravel pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean... And it, it was a very tense ward for... I mean, even still, I feel like there's still a lot of tension there. Part of the pressure, though, that came upon us is as we're attending church, like... So his family stops coming um, without him, the, uh, the perpetrator. The perpetrator. Um, and so perpetrator's family and stops. And both, both of the parents were released from their callings. But only after the I think there was just a lot of, made, there was a lot right? of pressure from. Right. Yeah. You know. Well, and part of, so he had an MO, how he would molest kids. He would either wrestle with them or he would play hide and seek and corner the younger kids. And usually he'd be with playing with the older kids, but he would end up with the younger kids. Like he finds so, siblings. I almost want to issue a trigger warning here because these yeah. are like tactics or techniques. Mm, yes. yeah. yeah. And so that that's yeah. how he found his victims. Well, part of the problem was mom and dad are both in high demand callings. And they're both at mutual. He's unattended every twice a week for an hour or so running around with kids playing hide and seek in the church building, turning on enough lights, like in wrestling with kids, which gives him more access. The fact that his parents yes. are in high levels of leadership gives him greater access to church members, to vulnerable right. kids. Well, and not only that, but like they're having meetings after church or they're, you know, he's getting out of activity days when he was a little bit younger and they're and still then, in their callings another half hour, hour. They're, yeah, they're dealing with other callings. You know, so people are, kids are running around the church buildings during mutual times, unfortunately. Because and... that's the safe place. That, that, I mean, that's the way that it's felt, right? And so um, as that's the case, um, he wrestles and plays hide and seek with kids. Like All the kids. lots yeah. of kids in the ward. And so right now we know how he he does stuff. And then we also know that with those kids... Um, you know, this was his MO. And then with the rest of the kids in the ward that he's been doing this, right? And so like that becomes a pretty immediate red flag um, for lots of families. They know that their kids have wrestled with him. They know that their kids um, have played hide and seek with them. And so at one of these special dinners that they have on a monthly basis, um, after it was known that this perpetrator had molested multiple kids, um, he's he's there at that dinner with and playing with all the kids in that group. All still. the kids in that group still. Mm. Even I mean, his though, parents know the, even bishop, though the knows. bishop and state president are at that 
they don't say anything because they don't feel like they can tell their wives either. They, yeah, and they their can't. kids are running around. They with, can't break penitent privilege. But you know what you can do? And say, hey, keep your son at home. You can do that. <laughs> Or you can or, cancel. Or he needs to sit in the corner the whole time. Like, I don't know what. No, I mean, what's even easier is it's like, hey, you know, we're just not going to have that dinner anymore. Like, we don't have to have the awkward situation. Like, you can protect people by not having your stupid right. dinner. Don't just like, right? ignore everything. and like, I mean, it's not that big a deal. And so, like, when I look at that and, you know, Ashley... On one of his, uh, the stake president's apology tours where he's coming to our house. And by the way, not apologizing, trying to convince us that it's okay. Like trying to convince He her. brought his wife over when Jared was gone to try to like talk some sense into me, I guess. Yeah. So just me and him and his wife. And we, we know them. Like To they, hear feelings, They right? bring their kids over to play and our, ride bikes around our house sometimes. And, you know, it's not like super weird. They wanted to bring me cookies, you know, trying to be like, oh, you know. And, you know, and I, I, I point blank, I'm talking to her and I'm like, do you know all the things that have happened? And like, do you know what your husband did? Like, I was very clear. And she's like, no, I didn't know that. Hmm. Like, she didn't know. She didn't know about him already knowing, like, at that dinner group. Like, she literally told me, like, I didn't know that. He didn't tell me that. And, like, do you know all the things this kid has confessed to? And she literally didn't know all that stuff. So well, he was probably sad that he brought her over. You know, a couple weeks mm -hmm. after this went down, we're having, there's a dance that's being held at our beach house. Because um, they weren't holding dances yet. So, like, during the pandemic, we did... Like a youth dance. Youth dances at our house. When at this time there was one down at our beach house. And um, so we're down there with two of our mutual friends, like mutual. They have kids that are at the dance. So we're all just hanging out, went to dinner while the kids were at the dance. And as we're sitting down talking to them, like one of, one of the ladies that we're talking to, um, you know, who argue or like who admittedly is between a rock and a hard spot. Like she, she's friends with us. She's friends with them. Definitely probably closer to them. But um, you know, one of her children definitely had wrestled lots of times uh, with this kid. But she, she, her daughter was the one with our nine-year-old at the time. At right. that, that Christmas party. And so one of the things that she asked though, is just like, yeah, it's so, this is so tough though. Like for this kid, like what if he decides um, because of all of this pressure, you know, the, the perpetrator um, to take his life. And I was like, well, I'm going to be honest with you. Like that's much less of my concern than what if your daughter finds out that she's a victim or one of the other victims in dealing with this takes their own life. He made choices they didn't. Like, and so I'm not saying that I'm unsympathetic to the plight that has been caused by his action, but it's been caused by his action. And so I can't worry about him. I'm not going to protect him um, and throw the victims under the bus. So I, you know, I mean, how tragic would it be if that were your child? Like, where would you land at that point? And like at the end of the day, like all they can do is acknowledge that and be like, yeah, you know, that would be tough. What, what we've found through this process is that when people can relate it to their own situation, like they will say to us like, oh, you know, yeah, I know this is hard, whatever, but you can see this side and how it's hard for the family. But then if you say, what if it was your child? Uh, it's like a switch flips and they're like, oh, well, if it was my child. Everyone's like, oh, you guys are so much nicer than I would be. I would go kill the guy. It's like, no. It's like, like you were just shaming us here a <laughs> second ago for, you know, why we need to be softer. And now when it has to do with your kid, you want to kill the kid? Like, how does that work? And so like, as we're going through this process, that's kind of what we're figuring out the the way that it plays out for people mentally. So that summer... They finally did move that family's records permanently to another ward in the stake. Yeah. And, and they... After lots of angsty conversations and, like, negotiations. Yeah. 
like, trying to it, negotiate, like negotiate with us. What if we do this? Can he, can that family still come to church? And like all, like, this they're is not, not trying to do the right thing. Like, we're trying to placate you guys. I'm like, this is not, there's right? no negotiations. Do what, what you're supposed to do. <laughs> and do you have a sense after, you know, they're being moved. So, and they okay, kind of further proximity, sneaking but things, isn't yeah. part of it containment also? Oh, the fact 100%. that like yeah. he's still like actively in places where he yes. can do harm. So yes. isn't it part of like, nice that my child has some space. And also do we have some indication that, you know, he's, he can't do it to Cause, other cause Catholic priests were, were just reassigned. That's right. right? Like right. that can inoculate well, a and whole the and then let them start they over. Ended up right? Moving them to is a ward that had the most kids of any ward anywhere around us. So <laughs> did you get an indication at all about that? Part of it, they they told us that, that they were taking measures to actually have it so that he wouldn't be around children. Well, not that he wouldn't be around children, He'd but that he would be supervised, like a, someone assigned to him by his parents. Mm -hmm. That was the supervision. Now, to be fair, his parents had also said that he would not be out of their sight when they dropped him off at our house. Mm -hmm. Like, so we've only found that stuff out later. But they had, they were more concerned about his sociality than they were about putting yeah. any other victim mm -hmm. um, in harm's way. They really wanted him to have a normal life. That was right. very important to them. So they finally, they kept kind of trying to sneak their way back into the ward, I guess. And they, they kind of did things behind our back. Like they had like a scout trip where they said like this, no one in the family would be in and they just didn't tell us about it. And they excluded our son's group. So that we wouldn't know there's a camping trip, and we heard it from somebody else that he was on. Like, so you're being punished, uh, yeah, for trying to get the church to do the right thing when it was your kid that was abused. Now you're being marginalized and cut out of, and your kids are being marginalized and cut out of activities right. as a punishment, right? And so because they just didn't want us to know about the activity, right? So and just, so what they had already told us. Um, prior to this, like probably a month before two months that, um, that none of their family would be attending any of the activities. Cause what was going on at a seminary for our kids and a testimony meeting, at, yeah, a testimony meeting, all sorts of things. Like there were things being said, like, Oh, it's so hard. What's going on for my family. Yeah, like the older daughter who was home from college would got up there and it was like really and people in the hall like we would hear all the time like oh we're so sorry for what's going on for your family people like, would get up so in hard. testimony meeting and like defend them and we're like oh my my kid was molested and i totally like forgave them so all of you guys out there this happened to you like you know make sure that you like you'll get your peace if you <laughs> wow. just forgive like it was very pointed wow Right. And so even when that happened, like that testimony specifically. Oh, and they were not supposed, to, he was, we had seminary graduation or whatever that one night, one Sunday night. And we had told him, hey, after, that was the same night, the same day that his family got on up in testimony meeting, it said some kind of dumb stuff. And we're like, there's seminary graduation tonight. You need to make sure that your son is not there. Right. And he wasn't even in seminary yet. So there's no reason for him to be there besides support his siblings. Who were, One sibling that was there wasn't even graduating. And then Jared, Jordan, my, or, yeah, showed up. She texted me. Jared took them. And she's like, guess who's here? Yeah. And he was well, like. Well, and I, I did tell them, though, that if, they're, if they brought their the son, the perpetrator, that I would make a scene. I said, I will lose my crap. And I'm not going to apologize for it. Like, and so... They did not, they showed up and they brought their son that was older. Um, and so, you know, we left it like we, even though it's not fun for our kids to see him there and them there, like whatever, but they specifically did not bring their perpetrator son um, to that because like I was just signaling. I was saying like, hey, here's my boundary. And if you... If you cross it, I will make the scene. Like I don't, I don't love confrontation, but I'm okay with it. Like I'm willing to do and it. And it was getting so ridiculous by this point. Yeah. And so anyways, we find out um, that, that they had created this activity 
that would exclude our son's group specifically so that their their other son, not the perpetrator, but their other son that was not supposed to be attending church um, with our family, um, you know, could go. And so then I call up the stake president. And I'm like, hey, what the hell? Like, what's the deal? They're supposed guys... to move them to a new world. And he's already. like, oh, no. Like, that activity um, was planned way before, and it was never meant for all the boys. Well, We find out from another mom who his husband was in war, or the meetings to plan this. They had planned this event, a special event, just so this kid could come and have an activity yeah, with the Lord. Because he was bummed. And I'm going to acknowledge that this is a hard thing for the siblings. Sibling. Yeah. Like, I get it. It was hard for us too. Like, we didn't like it. Nobody was enjoying what was going on. But my kids didn't need to be put in a situation every time that they saw this kid's brother, like, that, oh, like, we missed you. It's so hard. You know, like... People were fawning all over their family all the time. It was it was a lot. And so we just said this is inappropriate and it needs to stop. And so there was a lot of pressure on us to, okay, will you, will you allow this one thing? Like, will so you... much trying to negotiate with us. And but so... But, like, no, we're done with this. Like So anyways, that that's kind of how that played out. So... But that summer, they did eventually... They were trying to find a ward to put them in. And we didn't want to see him at any stake activities. And the stake changes were probably coming up. And so they put them, oh, how do you put it? Like the stake president told Jared, like, we're going to put them in a ward that right now technically is still in our stake, but probably pretty soon won't be. So it won't be a problem, right? He said, like, I can't tell you anything because, you know, uh, they're super secretive about when stake changes are going to happen and whatnot. Um, and so he couldn't tell me that they were going to be in another but state we would when be, the words We changed. would be fine with it in a few months, basically-ish. So they put him in this ward. The ward doesn't like it. And so what they do um, to placate... Well, because lots of people in that ward, I mean, ward gets around. Like, Doug, why is this kid who they know is molesting kids... Why are they moving him to our ward? Like, why we? He doesn't live in our how boundaries. Do we, how, how do we, do we get the honor? <laughs> yeah, like, and so they, you know, the bishop and the stake president. I'm sure higher up, they got a lot of crap, and they're like, why, why should we have to worry about this kid in our ward? So they hold a special second hour meeting, um, or the last part of what's it like called? Sunday school, Sunday school, or whatever, uh, with all the adults, um, where they give dad a forum to talk about what had gone on. So the whole state presidency is there. The whole bishopric is there. The area authority, authority is there. Comes, I mean, have you heard of an area authority coming to a second hour Sunday school meeting? Like, and so they let... Wait, to yeah. let the dad of the perpetrator... Talk? Like, emotionally process with the war? Yeah, like, give them, like, c- comfort that it's, it's fine that he's here. Is he wealthy? Is he connected no. to a general authority? Like... How has his family got so much power? I mean, I look, I I don't actually think it's about the family. Yeah, it's just about the church not wanting to be wrong. And so they're just going to back this the whole time. They can't back off it. They can't be wrong at this point. So they can't allow anything right to happen. This sounds ridiculous. It, it does. It was pretty wild. And so I heard this from somebody that was in the ward. Like they texted me. I mean, people tell us. I mean, word gets around. Like They texted me directly after it happened. And so instead of just, like, I've learned at this point through this process to not just trust uh, whatever gets said because, you know. People like, misinterpret things or they want to kind of be gossipy and you hear and you're like, oh, it's, sometimes it's half true. And So I called the state president and say, okay, here's, here's what I was just told. I want you to verify this with me because this doesn't sound right. I said I was told that. Um, the area authority was there, the full stake presidency was there, and the bishopric was there in this meeting, and that you guys let the father of the perpetrator stand up and essentially diminish the abuse. What? He said that my daughter, or my son, the only thing he got like convicted for was touching a girl on her boobs and her butt. Her chest and yeah, her chest bottom. And her butt. Yeah. But even still, like, why would you allow someone to even say that in a in a Sunday school meeting. Like, that's not appropriate anyways, which is, it's a lie. That's all, you know, like, it doesn't 
So it, it's partially true, like that. That was what he got convicted for because they didn't press charges for any of the toddlers. But they allow him to say that to a whole ward. But that was not the so the the weird hard thing with the way that this kind of stuff works is like first of all you get to plead out right like that you get to make deals with the da like that's how this goes um then the second part of that is when like there's only so much that they're going to throw at you and how so much that they're going to corroborate um and so at the end of the day we are not able to see the police report. Because he was only 13. And in California, you can kill somebody. And if you're under 15, you get six months probation. So that's all that this kid got. If it was another state, he would be in... He'd be in juvie. Yeah. Yeah. And so... But they only... They didn't... Yeah, they didn't prosecute for any of the three-year-olds because they couldn't cooperate his story. So there... And there's a lot more... There's a lot more that happened to the victims than that. But the point is... What what they're trying to do in this meeting is basically say like, hey, everybody we, is overreacting. Your kids are totally safe. He's being watched. Yeah. And, and the state president did not deny any of this. He's like, yeah, that's exactly what happened. So, yeah, when I talked to him, he's like, well, that that is what happened. That's and what we let, that's and, what he it, said, yeah. and it's like, well, you know that he confessed X, Y and Z. And you know that. Uh, victim A has shared. But she's, old, the, she's old enough to right, talk. All these other items that happened, like which are substantially more um, egregious um, than you know what you're trying to diminish it to. And so I was like, you know these things. He's like, well, um, he's like, have you seen the police report? And it's like, no, like you know, you know, you know that we I can't. can't. They won't and give it's it like, to us. Well, I haven't either. So how am I supposed to refute anything that he says? It's like, oh, that's an interesting statement there, buddy. Like, or you could not give him a form to talk. That, that's like it's a, not that hard. Like, just, it's like you yeah. know that he has confessed more to you. Yeah. And so it's like trying to use this narrative that you, since you don't have any proof in writing that there's more done or said, and that all you're trying to do is lull these people into sense of carnal security, right? Like I had to spin a little gospel phrase for him, but I mean, like all you're trying to do is pacify these people, and so, there there are real concerns here, like, right? And so mm -hmm. it's like um, molestation can take place in seconds. Like the definition of molestation is any unwanted uh, act that gives gratification to the perpetrator. So it can be touching somebody's toe if that's doing something for the perpetrator. Like it was not invited, it was not wanted, it was not consensual. And so And by the way, children can't give consent. Right. Well, Even yeah. if they're like, I want you to do it, they they're not mm -hmm. right. able to give consent. So it's right. a little bit more complicated than that. And by right. his own admission, he did do all these things. Like Right. And so like as I'm going through this, it's like even to the perspective of like if he's wrestling with these other kids, like whether he confesses to it or not, he's told us that there's gratification for him in wrestling with kids. Like that's how he does his thing. So in my mind, like, you know, that there's actually 20 more victims, right? You guys may not be willing to say or admit that you want to say that nothing happened at church, but he wrestles at church. He plays hide and seek at church. Like we know these things, but instead of, and he was very clear also, when he got up to say that nothing had happened at church, like the father did, there, right? All everyone was very always wanted to throw that phrase out all the time. Just so yeah. you guys know, nothing, nothing happened to church. Like very important. So I, I wonder how that happened. So Jerry ended McConkie. up calling mm. the area authority that was there. Yeah, and because so, we didn't realize that he, until a little bit later that there was an area authority at that meeting. So I do call the new area authority. So that was at that meeting, but he was not the area authority that had sent us that email. They just it was a, gotten, it was a new one. They had just gotten, and it wasn't him over. that was there. It was like a counselor or something. No, it was him. Was it? Yeah. It's almost like he was called to go clean up the mess. Maybe that's possible. But 
And so as I talk to him, he's like, oh, okay, well, I didn't know any of that. Yeah, that seems very well, inappropriate. I'm so sorry. They're getting their information from the state president. Right. So they don't, they haven't actually really investigated this. They're just doing whatever the state president is telling them that they should do. So that's the information they have. So of course they're going to do the same thing. I mean, they don't have any, they're not actually looking into this. Right. So they had, they had a, a few families, at least from that new ward, who either left entirely or moved their records somewhere else because they didn't want their kids around him. Right. And so in, in that process, um, there were, there were some anonymous letters that went out and there were, um, emails and things like, or not emails, but there, I, there were some things that went out, got mailed to certain people. Um, and I think there were, you know, basically just members who um, were, didn't want to speak out loud, but knew something was wrong and wanted to alert people of lies. And so we got contacted multiple times over multiple things saying that we're doing all these things, taking these secret hidden actions, um, which is frustrating. Uh, at the same time, I'm like, okay. kind of glad someone's well, people are doing stuff. We, like, we were glad that that was happening at the same time. We were getting blamed for all of it. Though. We're like, hey, um, at what point have we not been willing to stand up and, and be public and be public like so uh, you think we're the only ones mad about this yeah so please please stop calling us with every accusation because like we have no problem stepping up and saying names yeah, we and, don't need to be a secret and but, just to be clear so ward members or stake members or leaders are gossiping about you guys but no like they had send letters to, like entire wards saying that stuff they told you in your meeting that was a lie yeah 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 so so it happened, undermining a, it you. happened a couple. Um, no, well, no, no. Like, undermining like, the stake. Yeah, like saying, like whistleblowers kind of. Like oh. they're like, oh, the stuff that, like, like to this ward, like these stake leaders or whatever came to your ward, they lied oh, to you. Oh, so other people who were kind of on your side. Yeah. Yeah. And so then, to, but every time something like and that a few, happens. A few little things happen like that that we'd hear about later. And we're super grateful. Yeah. But we did get blamed for all of it. <laughs> well, and then so like, it's just like, okay. Uh, we are at this point being like the most vocal out of, uh, well, I mean, yeah, basically yes, out yes. of the people. And it's just like, hey, we don't have a problem standing up and saying what we need to say. So let's just stop pointing fingers. Like, let's just acknowledge what the stake and the ward needs to own. And let's just move on. When then we had gone anonymous, anonymous letter. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And so we got an anonymous letter telling us that while church was being held at our house, that two... Uh, like their kid witnessed. had witnessed that perpetrator putting their hands down these little boys' pants. Two of them. Two of them. And then one of those boys, um, one of the other uh, potential victims, their family received a letter. Because they, they told us about it. Right saying that this person that witnessed it was also another victim of this perpetrator. So, so now we know about nine So kids. they named the two kids. They, we have the names of the two kids, but we don't know who sent it or whose kid. And so at this point, like we received the awareness around these letters. Um, and we, we, receive, we receive awareness around the other family's letter first. Because they got it in the mail first and they, they called it. us and they knew like, hey, we got this about this kid. And apparently someone saw him doing something to our son in your backyard. And so as I find out about that, um, I'm like, I'm on the phone with my buddy who is telling me about this. And I'm literally going down to my mailbox, which our driveway is like 1900 feet long. So I've got a, it's a hike. To, to get down there. So I'm going down to check out and see if we have a letter in the mailbox too because I figure like it's a possibility. We don't know. Because we, we have know, another child who is a year older than, than her. We know that there's another victim at this point. We don't know who it is. So we don't know if it's another one of our kids. And so I'm going down. It's very down, possible because he was playing with both kids apparently at the same time. We don't know exactly what happened. So I'm going down to check this out. It's not there. Um, and so... Um, you know, my buddy who who's telling me about this knows, like, I'm really trying to figure this out. 
And then the next day we get a letter. Well, we get this letter and I talk to the state president. Well, it didn't, it didn't say no to our kid. It said that it yeah. happened at our house and that's why they were telling us. Right. And yeah. it gave a couple of names. The letter that went to the other family only named their kid and said that there was an additional victim. And so that's why I was going down the driveway to see if that mm, additional victim gotcha. was our child. Right. So and the next so, day we got a letter in the mail just saying that they were victims. It and it meant, named the two victims. Yeah. Well, not, not, not one us. of our kids. But it's two a, other people in the ward. The letter is addressed to us and it's saying, hey, there were these two victims. We felt like you should know because it happened on your property after, after church. church. And so... Anyways, I, I call and talk to the stake president at this point. And there's only so many families that came to church during COVID at our backyard. So there's not that many people to choose from. That could have written the letter. And right? that, yeah, who had little, and then even who, who had little kids there. There wasn't that many. So, you know, we do know that it's one of 10 families like that had kids that would have been there. And so I want to find out who it is because I'm not, I don't want to out anybody. Like if they want to remain anonymous, that's fine with me. But, but the we'll, more, the more victims that are actually confirmed, the more maybe we'll go against this kid, like the more legal action or. Right. So I want to corroborate. And so I'm trying to figure out who it was. And as I'm talking to the state president, well, the first thing um, that he says is, is like, well, I'm more concerned. He says, like, I understand where you're trying to find um, you know, who, um, who did this. And he's like, but I'm more concerned about the, whoever sent out, there was a letter that went out a couple of weeks before that said something negative about him. To the other ward. The stake president um, to the other ward saying that he had lied. And so. So he was more concerned about finding out who wrote the letter, calling him a liar to that ward than who is. Right. Who, so he's who, like, what, whether victims are. And, yeah. He's like, I would prefer that you help me figure out who's doing that over who wrote this anonymous letter. And it's like, what? Like, why would you say that? Why would you care more about that than about who's victims? Like, and it's like in the letter um, that went out was actually true. He's like, well, no, it's not. I, well, I didn't lie. And I was like, you absolutely uh, did not tell the truth in this thing. You know, and he's like, well, that's not the way I said. And I'm like, dude, whatever. I said, I'm just trying to figure out like who it is that was assaulted on my, or, you know, that witnessed somebody being assaulted on my property while you guys were holding church at my house. And he's like, oh, okay, well, you know, and kind of, and I said, look, I'll call you back after I've talked to these additional families. And I went around and I knocked on people's doors and I talked to them face to face. And um, whoever it was did not feel like coming forward and didn't want to talk about it. And that's, that's, that's totally their right. Um, but at least I was going to reach out and say, hey, in anonymity, you're still welcome to share this with me. Um, or go to the police yourself and no one has to know. Yeah. But also the, our friend who got a letter saying that his son was a victim had talked to the state president about it. And the state president told him, like, you don't need to worry about it. This is probably fake. And so... When I talked to the state president after the fact and told him like, hey, I've talked to all of these families. Here's what, what they've said. So, you know, I don't know that we're going to be able to figure this out. And I was like, but I think it's important. And he's like, you know, Jared, how do I know that you're not the one that wrote the letter yourself? And... I was like, if that is what you think of me, then you don't know me at all. And it's like, how do you not understand the amount of pain that has been caused to my family over my children or over my child being abused and over this whole situation? Like to think that I would like do that kind of thing to like, uh, like implicate the church is insanity. And this is a person that I've done a very significant amount of business with, like that has, that we have had a very close financial relationship. Um, one where, um, anyways, like there was a very good relationship of trust, at least on that respect. And so I'm like, I, what you're saying to me makes no sense at all. 
like, why would you say that? And he's like, well, you know, I'm not saying you did it. I'm just, and I'm like, dude, we're good. We're done. And so. I have to say that I've often, I, I've tried to kind of understand what the church's values are, what they care about most. And I have concluded that based on their actions of the past 30 to 50 years, what's most sacred to the church is their authority that their authority is respected and believed in and obeyed. That's the most sacred treasure of Mormon church leadership. And yeah. so that's why what this really came down to is who's criticizing the church and its leaders. Yeah. Right? Right. For sure. Yeah. I also see sometimes in this dynamic that you're having with people, you know, the person's kind of putting it on you, like maybe you wrote the letter and like at face value, it looks like trust, but it it feels like what they're really doing. And like, I'm thinking of your ward members too, is just protecting their own sense of safety right. in their world. Yes. So it's like, instead of actually holding that the reality is mm -hmm. that people are being harmed, like actively in my environment in a way that's really terrifying, I'm going to put it on you and say, wait, are you making it up? Because, or everything's okay. Everything's okay. We've got it contained. Things are fine. And those people that like really jump to that, it's, it's this, effort to kind of say, see, I am safe. No, I'm safe though. And they'd rather have the lie of that or believe a lie than a reality that's actually much more complicated yeah. and more like threatening and sad and truly like sad to hold. And the ch the children are the cost to that. Yeah. yeah. And around that time, I think is when we had a lot of chatter around our ward, I guess. So we, the perpetrator's father was the principal at the high school that our older kids went to and that most of the ward members went to. Hmm. And uh. so throughout this time, he was had, a person, that's a lot of influence. Yeah. yeah. He had had, um, was kind of not harassing our kids at school, but would kind of make like, he would, yeah, he'd be like, <sighs> like, you know, like, no, he, we had already talked to the district just because yeah. we wanted them to be aware of what's going on. And he had been instructed not to talk to our kids at all. And our kids are good kids. They don't, they don't go to the principal's office. So there's no reason for him to ever see our kids. But like, I would see when I would drop off at school, like they'd walk in and he'd like dramatically, like, ugh, like not like just super weird. And eventually they were kind of causing us enough problems that, and they had the victim's parents had been writing letters like emails to us and one of the other victims just like trying to like get us to forgive and like your toddlers are so young they won't remember anyways like in writing from both of them and like a conference is we just we just heard general conference like we heard this talk about forgiveness I hoped that in watching this they were watching too and they would feel it in their hearts to forgive us and so eventually this just got to be a lot with people talking in our ward and just a lot. So Jared had taken, we printed out all these emails because his name is on them and he's in charge of kids at school. Like he's a principal. So lots of diminish, <laughs> diminishment of abuse. But they had this all in writing. Right. Which and, was not. And pressure uh, for us. To back off. To and, back off and to let their kid live his life and. um to not drag his name through the mud and all this different stuff. And multiple times in the letters, like that your daughter is not going to remember, you know? And so, and so the, the mother is a teacher as well. They both work with yes. children. Yep. I guess but as, as a side, she was a charter school teacher and was going to kids' houses to homeschool them. And she would bring this child with him to play with the younger kids while she was teaching the older kids. The school did not care about that. So, you know. Yeah, I mean. They just said she wasn't, you know, we don't know what was going on. Right. I mean, everybody. Everyone every, wants to push off. Everyone the, wants to CYA, right? <laughs> like that's so. So so Jared had taken these letters and texts that they had texted us. They were super inappropriate for like a person in charge of kids to be writing 
like and showing specifically your, our kids. Yeah. And so he went down to like HR at the district and said, Hey, this is what's going on. Like this. And we, we need something to happen. Yeah. We, we need you to propose a solution to us that our kids never have to see our him kids don't have to see him at school. Like there needs to be some way we can figure this out with you guys. And I mean, the stuff in the emails, like if they had gone out like really public would make a principal district look not good, not good. Yep. And so the bottom line is um, we get an email like, like a mass high school email yeah. saying that he had been promoted to a district job and they were having an interim principal start the square off. Yeah. And so this was like a few days before the school yeah, year started. Like right before. And the people at our ward were pretty mad about it at us. Yeah. They love having, you know, they're in at the school and then they would like passive aggressively tell our, like our high school kids like, oh, it was so nice to know the principal. And you guys like now I don't even know the principal at school and like just dumb. Like what does this have to do with yeah, our pl older kids? Plenty like, of shame for us. Um, so we ended up. Retaliation. A so, little bit. so that that had happened. That was negative. And then right after that is when this letter thing happens. Oh yes. Yeah. And so I'm talking to. I think in between that we ended up moving our records to a new ward. We did not. That was right before nope. the letter. No. Okay. That we started attending the other ward, uh, but it was on a temporary basis. Yeah. Like we're like, you know what? We're gonna take a few weeks away. Because at that time, like not going to church wasn't really an option. Like no. So we're like, we need to go somewhere. And then it turns out they're happy to let us go somewhere else to get us out of their hair. So we start attending another ward, yeah. but we haven't moved our records. And it we had gonna, a, It was going to be like a three to six month break. Of, or less. Yeah, we didn't. Yeah, we didn't. And so been. then this thing goes on with the letter coming to our house. And I'm talking to the state president. And he's like, how do I know you didn't write it? And then I was like, you know, uh, you know, shot back. And at the end of that conversation, he's like, however, there is something that you can help me with, though. He's like, um, you know, if you could talk to Ashley because she's out messaging people online oh, in yeah. their new ward, you know, um, saying negative things about them. Which is funny because I literally didn't know anybody in that other ward. Like I was like, I was like racking my brain. Like, has I ever messaged anybody in that ward? And like, I was looking and I was like, I, I just don't, I don't know what he's talking about. And so and even I, if I did, I can message anybody they want but well so my point to that was it's like well that's interesting because typically ashley would tell me if she was going to do something like that but i was like you could be right like i could not know but i i don't think that you're right it's like but i will check i'll talk to ashley and i'll ask her now at that point like jared of today would be like okay great hope hopefully she did like hopefully she did message people like pound sand move on mm -hmm. like but that's not where i was like Faithful, believing Jared was like, hey, man, you got to you gotta make sure that at least if we are doing something that's adverse to the church, like it was intentional and like I wanted to at least make sure we're on the same page as to what's going on. So I verify with Ashley and I tell her, I'm like, hey, if you message somebody, no sweat, like absolutely, we should do whatever we feel. Um, but she's like, no, I didn't. And so I messaged him back and I'm like, hey, buddy, um, Ashley just told me that that's not the case. She's not private messaging people in the ward. She said, like, she doesn't even know anybody over there. Like, she's yeah, not. Like, I wasn't Facebook friends or anything with anybody in that ward. So um, I reply that back to him. And pretty quickly, he comes back and he's like, no, I saw the messages like myself. The bishop showed me or something. No, no, that's not what he said. And I, I, it's important right. to, to clarify that because... What he originally started with is that she was messaging a few people in the ward. That's he used that word carefully, few, right? And so that means multiple. And that's it's an important part of the story. And so then he comes back and he's like, No, I have seen the messages myself. I was like, okay. So I'm go back to Ashley. I'm like, hey, this is what he said. Like, and I'm I like, just, here, go through my phone. Like, just to like. I was like, I want to make sure, like, <laughs> because he's very confident. And so um, then I message him back after she re-verifies with me. Like, I, like, I'm feeling like I'm crazy here a little bit. And like, I absolutely think that's part of the intent of what's going on here. Um, but. I re-verify and I'm like, look, buddy, this would be the second time 
I know, or maybe this time it was a third time. time. But um, no, this would be the third time. It's like, you better get your ducks in a row. You better shoot me over the screenshots if you're going to be accusing Ashley of lying. Because actually, at this point, he had already accused her in writing of lying before twice. Um, And so uh, I said, so you need to send me the screenshot. And, And he's like, well... I have to get permission from the person let, or the, from the people is what he said. Let me get back to you. And so the next morning, this is Saturday, I think. Yeah. Next morning I message him. It was like Sunday morning, I think. Was yeah. Morning. And I'm like, Hey, what the hell? Like, where are these messages? Like either it did happen or it didn't. You can black out people's name. I don't care. Show me what she did. And then, um, he gets back to me, uh, when we're walking into church and his message was like, it appears as if the messages have been been deleted. deleted. Yeah. And I was like, okay. So my little brother, I call him up because I'm pissed off. He's a private investigator. He's He's on the high council. He's on the high council with this guy. (laughs) And I'm like, dude, you need to just tell him to stop contacting me. Because he kept trying to contact Jared to get him to like, Talk sense. Talk sense to his wife, basically. Yeah. Like, and so, like, at this point, I realized that he had lied to me. Like, and so then my brother talks to him on, on the phone. And he's like, okay, well, actually, what really happened is that there's some member um, of the ward that approached the bishop and showed this bishop a screenshot or something in her Instagram uh, from... Ashley and it said her name on it. And um, when she went back to look at it, um, it that the account was deleted. So oh, yeah. important note to make. It was one person, the stake president hadn't seen it, mm, yeah. and it was the bishop that had seen Lance it. At it I guess. And, and so this is something way too familiar. <laughs> right. And so then what ends up happening though is they're like, but when she went back to look at her message, the account, account was, was deleted. Yeah. I'm like, okay, so this makes a lot of sense. Ashley created a second account with her own name on it on Instagram, which she already has an Instagram account with her name on it. Like, why would she do that? Mm. Well, I mean, I and then and deleted. A, I can message whoever I want about this too. Like, yeah. Yeah, you what? you're you have a very um, upfront style, right? It's so, not like, like you would try. Even to... if you're accusing me of this, like, who cares? What what is a fake president? Are you going to do to me? Yeah. Like, but yeah, so it goes from he's he's mm. had multiple people say that they've been messaged. Now it's one person, and he's seen the messages. Then now it's one person, and he hasn't seen it, but the bishop saw it. And then you know, the, the account's gone. And then the account was deleted. So I think so, that day is the day that we officially. So that day moved was the records. day that we we're like, okay, move our records. Like we're done. We're not. We're not playing with you guys anymore. Like this is over. Um, but it was probably about two months before that though, maybe three months where there was a message, um, that got forwarded to Ashley. Oh, no, this was during state conference that spring. Okay. So a few months before. Yeah. So I've been a couple months, probably, I don't know, after like the initial stuff and at our ward conference. So this is earlier that year. We were kind of bouncing around. That's, That's fine. Um, the, the two counselors of the stake presidency were there. And so that was the first time they were hearing about any of this, the two counselors in the stake presidency. And my parents and his parents both kind of like approached them in the halls. It's like, hey, can you guys like help us out with this? Like, do you guys understand what's going on? Like my parents, my mom was like crying to him. Like, hey, like this is so unfair. Like they had no idea about anything. And so they had kind of approached her and me for a second. Like, hey, like, can you guys, can you like, give me a rundown of what's going on because we're not we're not really hearing anything. And so I had emailed both counselors who are both, I mean, friends-ish, like they're not close, but I mean, we know them. And I had sent them both an email together, just a really quick synopsis of everything that had gone on, what the church had done, all this stuff. And they both had emailed me back like, oh, we're so sorry. Like if there's anything I'm do, like, and then later that day, I see an email from the stake president to these two counselors, an email that was accidentally forwarded to me by somebody 
accidentally. I don't know if it was on purpose or not or what. Well, you can't accidentally forward something to somebody so that wasn't in the They had thread. obviously forwarded this email and their responses to the state president, who was purposely not on the email. And he had emailed them back saying that Ashley is lying about these things. And what else? I don't even Well, remember. I mean, basically, he's like, but um, we need to be empathetic. And so he said, she's not, what he said is she's not telling the truth. Right. But we need to be empathetic, you know, to their situation. And so that was it. But then, but then I got that email. The counselor in the state presidency forwarded that to us. And so that was the point where I was the elders quorum president. And I deal directly as the elders quorum president with my bishop and with the state president. Like, and so for me, like, I was still full believing um, at this point. And like I wanted to do um, whatever I could to stop interacting with these guys, and so I sent an email back like, "Hey guys, all of them, yeah. Um, probably should like not joking at all here. You guys probably should figure out how to work your emails um, so that this doesn't happen again. But you guys need to leave us alone on this." And I said, "But also, um, I want you to consider this my resignation as the elder scorn president." I'm like, I'm not going to continue to deal with you guys. And so that was it. That's what I, what I emailed over. And that was a huge deal for me. Like, you do not quit your calling. Like, but I also acknowledged for my own mental sanity that I was not going to continue to show up and talk about the problems of other families and figure out how we can help everybody else while my family is being railroaded, while my family is um being mistreated and so like i just i couldn't continue to do it and you know continue to have respect for these people when i knew what their what their actions were and the way that they were dealing and treating um us and so as that was the case you know i told them um that i resigned and and then after that so the first time that he called my wife a liar is in this email really that comes from the area authority, right? So that's in writing saying that uh, she wasn't telling the truth. And then the state president really defends the narrative on that in his response to the other father. The second time now was this email. And then the third time is this text thing where he's saying that my wife is being dishonest with me, you know? and and he did tell me that. He said, I don't know why she's not telling you the truth, but like, this is what happened. I've seen it with my own eyes. So, and then, you know, obviously he was lying about that. And so at that point, we're like, okay, yeah, we're done with this stake. Like, so technically the ward we moved into isn't, a, was in a totally different stake. And then that was like almost November when they're about to have state conference. And we, we knew they were, they were going to change the stake boundaries because of what they told us about where they're, what ward they're putting him in. And um, I was still getting like a lot of uh, people who would message me and be like, hey, like, is this stuff true? Like, I hear this. Or, does, you know, the bishop really say that? And so finally, like, the weekend of state conference, I decided to just put it into all lots of speculation. And I started making posts of texts and emails from bishops, state presidents, uh, area authorities, the parents to us, making different, just different posts about different things that happened, just making it very clear and very public. Right. And, and that was all, it's all on Facebook. I mean, she made those posts public. Yeah. So people, and, I, and I know I've heard like my siblings and other people have heard from People who are even on the high council who are like, this is not what we were told. Right. Like, this was not the narrative the state president told us in our meetings. Like, after, after the stake had been dissolved that weekend. So that's why I did it then, just because I knew that. What? Yeah. The stake? Yeah. So we knew that was kind of going to happen because of where they put him in the. They dissolved the stake. Yeah. That's what they do that. They'll dissolve an entire stake as, as a way to. And they say it handle. wasn't because of this. But uh -huh. I'm, I think it probably was expedited. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
but we don't there know that. There have been talks about um, changing boundaries and dissolving the state for like seven years. Um, and then, you know, we, look, we have a lot of friends and family that are in the state connected. And so we got, we, stuff. we knew exactly what the boundaries were going to be. We like, we knew all the stuff beforehand. So I decided that would be a good time to do it. Yeah. And so, but they, we believe that the stake disbandment was expedited uh, based off of this situation because it was getting, it was um, getting pretty bad. Some publicity. Yeah. And so, anyways, like, and also, and, and writing these posts, I got lots of people had kind of responded, like, uh, some, like a previous, a lady from our wood who never wasn't even active, she had gotten a call from somebody saying that they had asked her to come like testify in like a church thing and say how that this kid was like a good kid. Like, like she was a scout leader, like a long time ago. It was just super weird. So people they're, they're, they're trying to get people witnesses to do something. Yeah. I mean, basically just to say that, th- that this he's is overblown and yeah. he's a good kid. I don't know what they're planning. And she's like, no, absolutely. I will not do that because that is not the case. Yeah. Like, like that wasn't my experience. But we've heard from a couple people that have been like, yeah, some a random anonymous person called me that said they're from the church. That's all they said. And they asked if I would like be like a character witness for yeah. this kid. Mm. And so, I mean, just there, super weird things we heard after posting yeah, stuff. There's, like, there's lots and lots of stuff that goes on. Like, there's honestly, like, there's 20 more incidents, like, that we won't belabor the point on. But at the end of the day, like, we moved towards, like, and the stake was disbanded. Um, and so we ended up being in the same stake as the previous ward we were supposed ward, to be in. Right. As the ward that we were in. But the ward that they had moved to was in the, the neighboring state. Was in the neighboring state. So and it did so, work out how they had, you know. Right. But they were in a different state. Yeah. Yeah. What it really amounts to for me is that your child was abused and the church did everything they could to hide it. The Mormon church did everything they could to hide it, to cover it up. Yes. To protect the church and to protect the perpetrators and their families. And what you got in return was massive social punishment. Yes. In isolation, and you got your name smeared and dragged through the mud. Yes. As a result of your child being abused. Yep. For sure. Um, and so <clears throat> at about the point that we're moving awards, like this was the point that um I started doing soul searching. You know, this is probably October um of 2021. And what I started figuring out, because a lot of people would send us messages about other stories that they saw that were similar or whatnot. And so I, over a period of time, I watched a few Mormon stories episodes. Well, once you start like Googling stuff and looking up stuff, you get the algorithms of like the, right. you know, the abuse and stories. And... and I'm wondering, did you guys ever hear about the, the Colby and Cam Reddish Mormon stories I, episode? I didn't even watch that until like three months ago. So okay. I did watch the it. first time I saw Mormon stories was a clip that one of the other victims' family sent me, and it was someone talking about the same thing. And I was like, "Jared, look, look, this is exactly what happened." And this yeah. is this is like early, super so for early. Those on. who don't know, we did an episode about this a year or two ago with Colby and Cam Reddish, yeah. where they just found out about abuse that was going on in their ward and stake. It, not, I mean, I'm Colby's tuned in right now, and he's texting me a little bit. He's saying they didn't get it quite as bad as you guys. But it's a horrible story and, and basically the same thing. But this is in Idaho, right? Right. In like a suburb of, I think it's a suburb of Boise. Yeah. I, I forget. But yeah, like this is a systemic problem that is not just happening in two wards. Yeah. And I feel like we got a little more because we really pushed back on a lot of levels at different times. So we, you know, mm. probably not everyone would do that. And I, and I kind of hate like to say this, but we, you know, we have a decent amount of privilege in the situation. And like... Lots of times when abuse happens, people don't have that. They don't have the social backing, I guess, or family or like, I don't know how to say it. Like, like I feel so bad because like they would never know how to even right. push back. Well, and, and then also throughout this process, what we found is we had a lot, a lot of friends 
who came and shared their personal experience with us about their own abuse and how it was covered up. And I'm not saying like two or three people. That's I'm saying lot, like 15, 20 people that we knew firsthand. In our like, area, even like. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot. And so we start figuring out like the narrative that the church has around this, how they deal with it, that this is not one off. We're, we're originally thinking like, hey, this is just being mishandled. We're like, if we do enough, like we're going to fix our situation it here. It could change. And I remember at the beginning thinking, gosh, I know that the church cares about money. Now, at that time, I didn't know how much money they had or whatever. Like, um, But I was and if I could like call up Salt Lake and say, hey, I'm going to give you a $100,000 donation but I want an hour with the prophet. I just want to chat with him, you know, about what's going on. Maybe I could download to him what's going on and he could see the problem and we could fix this, you know? Like that's where my head was at. And I mean, cause really like the prophet could not be a part of this problem. That wasn't, that was not an option to me. He couldn't know that these things were going on and be okay with it. Like, so obviously this was a local thing that was broken. And then over a period of, months, I start to figure out that, no, this is the system that's set up. And the prophet is aware of this system. Um, and he is the head of the system. I know. Like, I was kind of like, lots of times I was kind of sad about this because I'm like, we would do anything. Even if it's looking at like our local like leaders, like we would do anything. We would donate money for anything they needed, offer anything they needed. Like we'd show up, we would do everything. And it's like, really? Like you're, this is what we get. Like, Mm -hmm. Even just our local leaders, like totally. Like, yeah. I mean, so our, our local leaders used us as a resource all the time for things. Um, not, not just financially, but to provide our house, to provide and callings. We, we did everything. Callings, yeah. Like, yeah, any, anything that we could consecrate, we would. And so the first item for me in a faith crisis surrounding this kind of where it started is I was like, okay, I know that this is now the policy. I understand that. And I understand that that thing does not come from God. God's not in charge of that. Like God does not protect an institution over children. It's not an option. Like even, you know, Jesus Christ in the Beatitudes is going through all of these things, love thy neighbor, like, um, you know, turn the other cheek, all that kind of stuff. But even in that process, he talks about um, it would be better that a millstone be hung around their neck um, than to offend his little children. And so, like, in the most gracious, loving sermon that he gives, he still says, but don't F with the little kids. Like, don't do that. That's the one thing that we stay away from. Right? So... From that perspective, by the I way, knew. Jesus never said anything about LGBT individuals at all. Not a not a single thing. Right. But what he did say is, "Don't mess with the children." Yep. Yes. And yet the church spends a gazillion dollars. Yes. And time, you know, fighting LGBTQ people. Yes. And yet they just inexplicably spend a ton of money and power protecting abusers. Yes. And dismissing and trying to silence and um, victims. So yeah, it's, it's inexplicable. It is. And so I'm starting to figure this out, right? And so I'm starting to understand how the church deals on this thing in the narrative that surrounds that. And so over the next period, I've decided that like, look, this is so painful to me and my family. I need to make sure like where I stand on this. Like, Should we talk about our new word? Only oh. maybe it's just a high level. Yeah, I mean. So I we do have an, yes. one more. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. You should share. So we went to a new ward. We went there because our our friends were there, and we just we needed a place to go. And not, I don't remember how long it was after that. Somebody tipped off one of our kids, and they told us that there was somebody in the ward that was an abuser of kids. He'd never been prosecuted, but he had been released from a high calling. And so just, you know, just be aware of your kids. Oh, my gosh. And this is in the new, we just come from a ward where we just, you know, had all this happen. 
and we get to a new award and we hear this and you know this guy had he talks to all the kids in the ward like he would sit in front of us and like turn around and talk to my little girl and be like oh what are you coloring like all this stuff you know and um so jared calls a couple people just to kind of see you know this was a kid that, that told our kids you know we don't know what's going on and we don't want to make problems already we just moved into this ward and so Jared calls a couple. Well, you don't of, want this to all happen again, yeah. right? So Jared calls a couple of yeah. the buddies in the ward that he knew from before, and they confirmed it. Yeah. yeah and yeah. like he, you know, it's somebody and who he had been subbing like he'd been as a music person in primary. He was not supposed to be around. He his his records are annotated apparently, but he's never been convicted. But he's not supposed to have callings with kids. And so, and so anyways, we, were, we were mad. Jared called up the bishop and he, the bishop actually did come to our house. Cause he and was, he, and he apologized. He's like, I should have told like, you guys, I know your circumstances coming in here. Like I should have. And so like, and since then, like like he, was, that, he was sincere. I know no one wants to be in that position. Well, I, I mean, I get it for sure. I mean, so no hard feelings were like towards him. It's just a situation that is. But since then, you know, there, there had been a change in that, that man has not, we haven't seen him. The, the stake with... president, because I had emailed stake president as well, and he already knew the a new stake president, like different about stake our president. situation. And I was like, really, <laughs> like, and he, and I said, he's also in a presidency in the ward, not over kids. But I was like, you know, there was an eldest crown president, you know, like in what Michigan or something that was the eldest crown president, and ended up, you know, in a car with a teenager and molested him and he wasn't over kids, you know, like, and so I told him, like, I, I emailed him the story and I was like, this guy shouldn't be in a presidency either. Like people respect that. They think it's fine for him to right. go to people's houses. And he, you know, he emailed me back and was like, I will talk to him and I will make sure that he knows he's not supposed to be around kids. And like, you know, like those people listen to that, but. but well, I mean, so the, you know, there is that, I just have to say that that the the Mormon Church is a harbor for abusers. Yeah, yeah. just like the Boy Scouts of America. And it we is. even we even mentioned this guy to a couple people in the ward, and they're like, "Oh no, like that was just rumors. Like I'm sure that person was just being like." Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was. <laughs> and, tough. I, and I also have to say that I, you know I live along the Wasatch Front, which is you know Salt Lake City and all, all throughout Utah. Pretty much every week, there's a news article yes. about a bishop or a seminary teacher or an elders quorum president or a home teacher or a visiting teacher or a trusted ward member who who is incarcerated or convicted of abusing a kid. And those are just the ones they get that, that <laughs> get caught and we hear about. That's not the ones who get caught, but then it's silenced, let alone, let alone the ones who never get caught. So it is an epi the Mormon Church is an epidemic has an epidemic is a safe harbor for abusers. Period. Full well, stop. For sure. And th there is one more thing that happened, like right as we entered this other ward, that I found out within a week or two um, of moving to the new ward, that kind of contributed to my understanding of how everything goes down with the church, and that is that during the pandemic. Um, the stake president of the new stake that we just entered um, was mysteriously quickly released. And, and moved. And moved. And so didn't think anything of it. We go to the new ward and one of the people in the new ward says something to me like, oh, yeah, like President so-and-so, um, you know, he got caught with a pro. I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, yeah, he, he got caught with a prostitute. It's like, what? So we, we confirmed the story with the news. So, and, stake, uh, wait, the stake president? The previous stake president before the guy, so the new stake we're in. Yeah. The stake president before the guy that's in there. Was with the prostitute. Got arrested. Was a sex worker, I guess. We While yes. he was in the stake, While he was well, the stake, stake president, president, he got arrested for and didn't tell anybody. So he'd right. been stake president for many years and no one knew. So for four years <laughs> after getting caught um, with the prostitute, um, and by the way, his attorney was a member of the stake. Right. So interesting. Um, we get attorney client privilege, whatever. But 
you still can call Salt Lake. You can still or say, tell hey. them that, hey, like, or you're a state the- president. You should probably let somebody know that you right. got arrested. Like, But either way, um, he, what ends up happening is he's going to get his records expunged um, after having been a good boy for four years or whatever um, as a sitting state president. And um, somebody walks into the court that day and sees his name on the docket. And they're like, hey, that's a pretty specific name. Uh, and they pop their head in and they figure out like, oh. It's a state president. It's a state president. And then it was public record, but just nobody had really found out about it. Because no one, why would you look that up? Like, Right. Yeah. I mean, so anyways, look, do I care that he was a, with a pro from a moral perspective? That's his deal. Like, whatever. But from a like, call from God, giving people a temple recommend interviews, like all that stuff, it's. It's skeezy. Yeah. But what's even more skeezy is the fact that he just gets released. Nobody says anything like, you know. No one knows. No no one knows. And so then we find out about this. I text my brother who was somewhat friendly with him. And he didn't know anything about it. But he's a private investigator. So he pulls up the court records real quick, shoots it over to me. And... You know, the narrative after I found out about it was like, oh, he was going to get a massage on his ankle because he had rolled it or something like that. And, you know, and it's like, no, actually, it was at 7 a.m. on a Thursday morning at the Airs Suite, which is a, um, a hotel, you know, hotel down the street or whatever. It's like, first of all, I don't think people get caught their first time with a pro either way, neither here nor there. But the the more important thing is, this was intentional. This was 7 a.m. at a hotel. Like, this isn't like some ankle massage gone wrong, right? Like, you don't meet at a hotel for an ankle massage. Like, that's how it goes. And once again, like, tragedy for the family, like, all of that. But honestly, like, the church should stand up and be like, hey, you know what, guys? This is what happened. This is why he's being released. Um, we're going to move on. But it is so important to them to protect the authority and to protect the narrative. And so that happened. Then we see this thing with the, with the guy in our new ward. And so it really causes me to start looking at how the church deals when something goes wrong. Do they stand up? Do they confess and forsake? That's what I was looking for. Are they confessing and forsaking? Telling me to do it, right? It's super important that I do it. Um, no matter what my sin is. And so these super serious sins are being swept under the rug. Not that big a deal. You know, there's no public excommunication for the stake president, right? What happened or didn't, I, you know, I was publicly shamed multiple times, right? Um, for doing for, healthy normative. For, for doing small things relative to the things that are coming up here, right? I mean, at least even in context um, of what they believe. And so I'm looking at this. I'm like, this doesn't add up. And so if the church, then I, I start to figure out like, okay, I want to know for sure that the church is true because now I'm starting to go through a lot of pain. And so I'm... I'm no longer feeling the same things that I felt before, you know, around spirituality, around like I hear a talk that used to maybe make me like feel the spirit. Like a a good example of this is like President um, Holland or Elder Holland. Like I always used to get super emotional um, when I would hear him speak. And then I'm starting to listen to the things that he's saying now. And I'm like, hmm, that sounds a lot like the narrative around this thing and like that. So I start looking at these things more skeptically and looking at them from a lens of like, is that actually protecting a narrative or is it actually protect, or is it like actually revelation? Is it actually like loving doctrine? And I start seeing patterns. And one of the things that really upset me was there was a special California broadcast um, by the prophet and his wife. And they were talking... Um, this is President Nelson and Wendy. President Wendy's Nelson here. and Wendy. Uh-huh. And she starts talking about this experience that I had heard a few times. Um, 
And when I hear this, like I'm in active mode of trying to preserve my testimony and like seeking to find those things. Like I'm watching lots of talks. I'm like reading scriptures. I'm trying to hold on to what I can. And I'm looking for spiritual experiences. So I'm watching this. And she talks about this experience, which I'm sure you've you've probably heard, where in the middle of the night, she feels prompted to get up and get out of the bed because like there's this amazing spiritual experience that her husband's about to have. And he has some experience, but it was too sacred for her to be in the room. And I'm like, man, like if it's so sacred, like why can't they share it with us? Or if it's so sacred, then they don't need to share it with us at all. Like if it's too sacred to tell us what it is, like this looks like gaslighting to me. This looks like giving me partial information so that I give something importance that is probably a nothing burger, you know? Like, and you're building something up to be so special and spiritual. And by the way, at that time, I also could acknowledge like, Joseph Smith was willing to come out with and say fantastical things at the drop of a hat, right? Like he was definitely willing to say like all these manifestations and receive revelations whenever it was pertinent. Yet we can't talk about some spiritual experience where Jesus appears or somebody appears um, to the current sitting prophet. Like, he definitely has that line of authority where that's what's supposed to be going on, right? Like, so they should be able to tell us about this. So I noticed that. And then I start looking at other things that I've had problems with in the past through church resource. Like, so I'm starting to read some of the gospel topics essays uh, in dealing with um, Fox and the Priesthood, in dealing with polyandry, in dealing with um, so many other issues, but I'm going to the faith informed narrative. And what I start realizing is that the explanations that are being given to me sound a lot like the lies that are being told to me in the other areas of my life that I know that the church is lying and that I know that the church is just protecting themselves. And so I go through this process over the next six months until like April conference last year, not this year, but, and I know that the church, you know, one of the things like that kind of lands for me at the very end is the church has this narrative around being generous, like that they do and give so much. And I'm not a mathematician, but I understand stuff pretty well when it comes to financial matters. And I know that if you're giving on average $200 million in a year and you're a $250 billion organization, that's not 1%. That's not even a hundredth of a percent. So we've got a problem here. That's not generosity. And so why they're hoarding funds, why they're amassing wealth, I don't know. But one of the things that was said in that conference um, was... Uh, being like reposted later on that day um, that Elder Oak said about the church's generosity. And so I get on because um, I'm mad when they're talking about the church's generosity because uh, I know that that's not true. Like from any numerical standpoint, like they're not generous. Now, the church's members are generous. Absolutely. Lots of giving members of the church. But the church as an institution is not generous by anybody's definition. Now, they made, you know, anyways, financially, they are not. So I get on and I, I make a comment on that on the church's page or on their Instagram or Facebook or whatever it was. And um, a couple hours later, um, it was deleted. And, you know, I, I mean, all I said is like, you know, definitionally, like you guys are not being generous. You guys ask for 10% from the members, but you're not even giving 10% of what you're given to the poor. You're not doing that to do good. And you have so much. And so anyways, it gets deleted. And 
like for me, it was just, it was that point that I realized that it wasn't true. Like that the fact that they had to tell lies around everything to prop up some narrative, it just couldn't be God's church. And that was devastating to me. That was so hard. And I had been like, I had been preparing for a while mentally, like, what if this isn't true? And that was kind of like that breaking point for me where I was like, okay, no, this doesn't come from God. I don't know what it is. I don't know if Joseph Smith was a fallen prophet. I don't know if Brigham Young or somebody else took a right turn or a left turn when they were supposed to go the other way. But I know that this, this system doesn't come from God and it's not being run by God. So that's what I knew at that time. And so at that point, like I was um, emotionally out. And so I was fearful at that time. I did not know how Ashley was going to receive that. I hoped. And I, and you know, we had kind of talked about it in, in uncertain terms and whatnot, but it was, like there was risk, but I told her that night, like, I am done. Like, I don't believe this anymore. I, I, this can't be coming from God. And I was super passionate about it. And I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty passionate guy. Um, but it was very frustrated and I had felt very betrayed. And so anyways, that's, that's kind of, that was the moment for me where I decided that this isn't God's church. It, you know, it may have just as much truth or what, you know, I, I didn't need to figure all that out. But at that point, I would have considered myself a PIMO. Like I was still going to attend church. Which stands for? Uh, physically in, mentally out. And so, um, so we kind of kept doing that thing. And then probably um, a month and a half, two months later, um, I hadn't still consumed like any real, like not faithfully informed content. Like I was, I was very careful. I was trying to keep my faith. Um, and at that point I also was like, uh, I, whether I believe it or not, it doesn't really matter. I don't, my, my thought process is I don't want to piss myself off so that I don't want to attend church. Cause I think it's good to go to church with my family. So that's where I was at. And then um, I started watching a TV show um, called um, uh, Something No More. Um, Mormon No More? Mormon No More. So next week we're going to be releasing an interview with uh, with the parents, with, with, with basically Rod and Nan, okay. the, the parents of uh, Sal. Yeah. Which is one in the couple, Sal and Lena from Mormon No More. Yeah. yeah. Well, I watched the whole thing in one night. Like it was, it's pretty long, you know? And um, this is a Hulu documentary about two married Mormon women who end up falling in love, leaving their respective husbands and getting married. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's a beautiful documentary. It is. It was a beautiful story. And also understanding at that point, like, I had also felt betrayed because so many of my beliefs surrounding sexuality and surrounding um, the LGBTQ community were directly informed by what I was given by the church. And so a lot of my feelings over the last five years had kind of turned on that and they were in dissonance with the church's stance. Um, but at that point, I'm watching this, lots of empathy, but um and like really feeling you know lots of um i don't know shared narrative from a lot of things that they felt and heard and went through and so anyways as as i'm watching this they reference the fact that the ces letter was something that um that was a shelf breaker uh for one of them and I was like, what is that? And so I Google it. And lo and behold, um, 
a lot of the the questions that I had about the church, where I had only read the church's narratives, um, were in this letter, the CES letter. And so I also um, stayed up. I basically stayed up all night that night, and I read the whole CES letter. And um, that's um, a you know basically this document that talks about a lot of the issues. Um, that the church has to apologize for or has apologies on. And so I go through that process. And by the time that I read that letter, now I'm mad. I hadn't believed that a lot of these things that the church had done were necessarily super nefarious. I just thought like, okay, maybe these guys just believe it, but they, you know. And so then over the next few months, like I start consuming, um, you know, content on Mormon stories. I start, um, listening to other podcasts and really starting to do research. And from that time, I've put hundreds and hundreds of hours into deconstruction. Like I'm figuring out why I believed what I believed, how it was created and why it was created. And so that process led me to a point over the last, uh, probably over the next six months, where I decided that I could no longer be affiliated with or attend the church. And so that that's kind of the process that I went through. And um, lots of frustration, lots of anger, um, and you know, lots of angsty conversations between Ashley and I over the issues surrounding the church and um, how we would deal with that. And, you know, but ultimately that's, that's kind of the thing that helped me to start deconstructing what had happened throughout my life in the church and how I felt about those things. And, um, has ultimately left me to a position where I'm no longer a member of the church. Like I, I no longer have my name on the records. Um, I have zero affiliation with the church um, out of truly a matter of principle. Like I can't be involved with the church anymore and believe what I believe about who they are and what they represent. And so, and I acknowledge that it's not that easy for every person. Like not everybody comes to the same conclusions that I do after looking at the information that I do. There's lots of nuance. And, um, but I had spent a lifetime in dissonance, like in trying to figure out why certain things would be the way that they were, what putting things on my shelf, making excuses for leaders, having to make excuses to be able to maintain my faith. And so I got to the point where I was like, I have been, I have spent a lifetime trying to um, make apologies for this institution. And I need to be in a spot where I am only true to one thing. And that I, that is what I believe. And that is the information that I can take in just because there is a church leader that I know and I'm affiliated with and think is a smart guy just because he can read one thing and believe the way that he does does not mean that my opinion on that thing is any less valid. And I don't care if he has a degree. I don't care what his education level is because what I did start to learn and understand is that when you have to be faith informed in order to make a decision as to what you believe, like logic goes out the door. Like, and when you're telling me that I have to see something through spiritual eyes for me to be able to know the truth of that thing, that's where I have to say, wait, that's a red flag. And then when I realize that in order for me to keep my testimony together, that I have to do that on almost everything, or frankly, on all of the issues that I actually have with the church, in the order for me to come to the most reasonable conclusion that I have to ignore my, my logic, and I have to you know, know that, oh, 
but we'll figure this out after this life. That's the only way that I can keep my faith together. That's the point where I have to say, okay, this is wrong. This is fraud. You know, and so that's kind of, that's where I landed. And so that caused some complications in the family and trying to figure out how we deal with our kids and, um, you know, who attends when and what. And, but that. Let's leave that part out. But. (laughs) Yeah. Do you. Um, super powerful. And it sounds like the past couple of years have been extremely difficult and enlightening for you, Jared, and probably for both of you, Jared and Ashley. Ashley, do you want to share anything at all about that part of your journey or is that? No, I'll, I'll let that be Jared's story right now. Okay. 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 Any, and anything you want to add? No. Okay. 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 So. And I'll just add, if if it's okay, I'll just add that, and it gives me no pleasure to say this, but I've been studying this stuff now for 20 to 30 years, depending on how you count it. And there's some things that are factual that uh, you just, no, no one who's honest can really refute. I'll start with Russell M. Nelson his own daughter and son-in-law have been accused of sexual abuse of children. Now, I don't know if those are accurate accusations, but the fact that almost no one knows about it and and the fact that it means nothing, right? The the fact that they weren't convicted means nothing. Um, There's, there's at least some chance that they're guilty. Um, And uh, if, if folks don't believe me, you can just Google this, and there have been lawsuits and there have been newspaper articles. But I also know that the church can use its influence to silence news stories. And I, I know that yeah. firsthand. So there's that. We interviewed Christine Burton, who it was a, a niece of of uh, Gordon B. Yeah. Hinckley. And her dad was, you know, Thomas S. Monson's mentor when she went to report her sexual abuse and physical abuse by the hands of her own mom and parents, you know, to both Russell, uh, to both Gordon B. Hinckley and Thomas S. Monson separately, their responses were, Hey, yeah, this happens. And, you know, you need to forgive and move on. Yeah. So we know that that's Russell Nelson, Thomas S. Monson, Gordon B. Hinckley. That's how they seem to feel about abuse. And then you go all the way back to Joseph Smith and you look at his, there's no other way to say it, sexual predation. He was a sexual predator. He right. went after uh, other men's wives. He went after sister pairs, mother, daughter pairs, 14 year olds, lots of teenagers sexually using his power and influence. And right. he, um, he even went as far as to shame and, demean and malign the women who declined his advances, including Nancy Rigdon, Sydney Rigdon's own daughter and right. several others. So I, this is like the worst thing to say, but if we're just being honest, you can say, what do you expect from a church founded by a sexual predator yeah. that the church is going to protect victims? No, they're going to protect the perpetrators because the yeah. fish rots from the head. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've ever been that forceful before, but how can it feels like a reasonable conclusion here? Yeah. I mean that, you know, the, even still today, the narrative around Joseph Smith with the 14 year old is like, well, we don't know that he slept with her. It's like, well, we do know what the revelation on polygamy said, what its purpose was. And we don't do know that the prophets after him who had similar age wives slept with those wives because they had kids with them. So since there's this, this weird fascination that we have with making sure that he's portrayed in a certain way, or really second to Jesus Christ, right? Like we got to make sure that his image is protected. And so that, once again, like as I, as I went through that process, I found for myself that 
you should not have to have a nuanced opinion of every single controversial issue with the church. Like that can't be God's design because if it is, then God screwed this up, right? Like he's messed up. Like he, he didn't know how to create his own church in an appropriate way where like you don't have to create all these obstacles so that people can have faith. That's not the way that it works, right? Like would we, would you do that to your kid? That doesn't make any sense. So, you know, uh, so that's, that's where I've landed on this. And honestly, uh, there's such a narrative in the church that if you leave the church, uh, that your world is going to crumble. You're not going to have happiness. Like you're the prosperity doctrine, like your finances are going to fall apart, like all sorts of weird stuff. You know, I'm, I'm in business and I do business with a lot of LDS people. And so like, there was some fear around that, but ultimately like I had to make the decision for myself that I am going to live the rest of my life being true to what I believe and being true to who I am. And that is going to be um, what it is. And if that means I lose business, if that means I lose friends, like, and at the cost of my long held faith and my security around knowing what's going to happen to me after this life, like, then that's going to be what it cost. And I don't want that. I don't want that pain. I don't want to go through those things, but I also know for my own psychological welfare, like I need to be true to who I am and to myself. And I can't continue to gaslight myself and say, Oh no, but maybe it's this, or maybe it's that I'm not going to do it. And so that's, that's where I landed. And while it has been traumatic, like it feels like a ton of bricks has been taken off my shoulders. Like I am happier today on a daily basis than I was ever living in the church. So the narrative that life is going to be worse and that you're not going to feel the spirit as much and all that, it's not true. Or at least I haven't found it to be for me. And so I can't say what everybody else's experience is, but I can say that I'm a happier person. I'm a better dad. I'm more present for my kids. I don't have some narrative that they have to live within in order to be accepted by me or loved by me. They don't have to meet some specific expectation uh, for me to judge that they're doing the right thing or that they're going to be happy. Like that's, that's not what it is for me. So I can have a deeper, more holistic relationship with my children based off of who they are. And for me, um, having that space for them to express themselves as well as having space for myself and not feeling like everything that I do is wrong and that I need to repent. Like one of the realizations that I had is sometimes I would be praying in the morning um, and repenting of things that I didn't know what I was repenting for. I was just like, hey, please forgive me for my unclean thoughts yesterday. Please forgive me for, you know, anything that I did, you know, that was wrong. And like, I'm showing up every morning for myself and to God, like being like, hey, I know I screwed up. I'm not quite sure exactly how I screwed up, but I am a screw up, right? And so thank you so much for being there for me as a screw up all the time. And I don't do that anymore. That's not the way that I show up for myself. And I feel better. Like I'm happier because of that. So that's, that's my story. Yeah. And I, I feel I'm now feeling regret for the harsh words I spoke, but then I think about the fact that the church was willing to pay 750 million for the boy Scouts abuse lawsuit that a one or two billion case was just announced yesterday and that that just the instances of of sexual abuse that's been covered up in the church all these episodes we did with Tim Kosnoff about his defense of of abuse victims and just the the hundreds of accounts that we have of Kurt McConkie 
silencing victims and telling church leaders to not report abuse to police authorities. I think, I think harsh words are warranted and we all want the church to do. We all have, we, I think we all three have love for this church yeah. and gratitude for this church. And it's so confusing to have an organization we all love and that we have all benefited from so significantly to find out that it's has such an abusive past and present. And yet that's where we are. And so all we can do is those of us who are in a position of courage and or privilege to speak up and to speak out and to try and help inform people so that they don't put themselves or their loved ones in harm's way and then put, you know, help encourage or influence the church to fix this because they've got $250 billion of, of amassed wealth. They can fix this. Yeah. They can, they can fix these problems. They can make it. So the next family that speaks up the, the Colby and Cam Reddishes, the, the, the Jared and Ashley Joneses, the next families that speak up about abuse that's happening in their own family or in their ward or stake that that gets a very different outcome happens than the one that happened with with the Joneses and the Reddishes. And I'm sure with thousands of other families across the world, right? I'm sure it's not just two, right? uh, Often the question that gets asked of me is like, okay, you've got a lot of criticism for the church. Like, but, you know, what can they do better? What is it that they could actually change? And so I can tell you, there's a lot of things. Like, first of all, our bishop and stake president in this situation, I I have a lot of feelings on this, but ultimately, they should have been conflicted out. Yeah, they should not have been put in that position to have to make that judgment call. They should not have been in that position. So there can be a specialist who's an ecclesiastical specialist, not an attorney, that deals with these things, right? So the decisions are off their plates. Yeah, And then there also can be the decision to just report. Every state, you still can report. They just don't require you to report, right? Right. You're not mandated to report, uh, apparently, in Arizona, like according to the judgment that just came out on that or the decision on that. But, I mean, you can have that as a policy. You can tell everybody, hey, if you're going to confess a crime to me, I am going to report it. And we've heard it said, like, if we do that, then people won't confess to us. And to that, I say, then who cares then? Who cares if they don't report if nothing's going to be done anyways? Right. If the, then the bishop's just going to know stuff's going on in the ward and can't do anything about it. And so, like, those are some pretty simple changes that can be made. Like, there's multiple other changes, like uh, interviews with kids. Like, that's a really simple one. Um, there's There's no reason that they need to talk to teenagers about their sexual thoughts. And if they want to um, do that, there there can be some sort of other scenario where they, honestly, uh, truly, I think that they shouldn't do it at all. I don't think that there's any sense in it. Kids going through their own puberty and going through, even if they have consensual sex, like it has nothing to do with anybody. If they want to come and talk to somebody about it, like then they can go see a counselor. You can refer people to counselors. Like, that's a real thing. You know, there are people that understand these things and get paid to do them. Yeah, the bishop oh. just isn't qualified. Right. I used this. to wear it as a badge of honor that the church didn't have a paid clergy. Now, I look at that and I'm like, that's insanity. That's not a badge of honor. That's a badge of stupidity. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, there are people that are trained to handle these things. They should not be taking confessional. They don't have the spirit of discernment, like to be able to tell you, like, okay, this is how you fix your problem. Like, that's not how it works. It's especially um, insane when we know that the church is worth a quarter of a trillion dollars. They can afford better training for their clergy. Yeah. Right. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like, they can mandate across the church that people are. Uh, scanned live scanned like we california just, check, sure. california just did this last year yeah so yeah. everyone who had callings with kids or any leadership calling had to go do 
But California mandated it. Um, That's California. That's not the church. church. Like the church could easily do that. They can buy their own machines. It's a super cheap process. Like if they want to do that. But why do you think they don't want to ferret that out? Like they get up in conference and say that they want to protect the children. Hmm. Do you? Like, and you also cannot have, like, if you do find out about abuse, you can not have them call the attorney first. Like that establishes attorney client privilege, right? So like, how does that work? That's, that's not about the kids. Have them call the police first and, uh, you know, license secular mental health professionals yes. to support the and kids. The background check won't catch everybody, but it'll catch a lot. But yeah. it's something, but yeah. The, the, but church, the police will help. There will be accountability right. yes. towards the perpetrators. The church does say that they do care. But none of their actions show that. Not one. There is not one action that the church has taken over the last years that I can find that has shown that they actually care. Put your money where your mouth is. Do something. And so... Or at least don't push back, use your money to push back against laws that are protecting yeah. the clergy. Well, and the, you know, that's there's a Utah law that um, just got shot down to make clergy mandated reporters. Like, why is the church lobbying so hard for that? Like, why do you have to keep your skeletons in the closet? Once again, like they're told that they don't have to report. They're not told that they can't report. And so why would we not encourage reporting? That doesn't make any sense. It takes the liability off the church. So, yeah. So those are the things that we see that can be changed. And there's there's a laundry list of others, but those are the major ones. The church can make positive change. I do believe that this verdict that came out yesterday in Lake Elsinore, um, which is right around the corner from our house, um, where they were awarded $2.28 billion. Um, I think that it was a message to the church. The church had already settled out for a million dollars prior to this judgment. So that was the extent of their liability. But I believe that the jury was saying to the church, the only institution that had money really to give in this, like, hey, this was a big deal and you guys were at fault here. And you have a lot of money. This is a big judgment. We realize that this dad um, or stepdad that was the perpetrator is never going to be able to pay the two point, you know, some odd billion dollars that he would be liable for. But if you guys were still in this suit because you hadn't settled out, it would have been a big one. It would have been a big one. And so the church will learn when the finances get hit. Because one thing that we can say for sure is that they do care about their money. Why they protect their money, we can say it's because it's the Lord's. We can say whatever it is. Maybe it's they need to build New Jerusalem. I don't know. But what I do know is that they care about it. And so at the point that they get hit with more than a billion dollars on a single case, and they start to feel that that is a real possibility to happen over and over again, you better bet that things will change. They will. So the pressure needs to continue. So if you're an active believing member, like you can push on the church to do the right things in your local area, but the people that are going to make the change are the stories of the people that leave, the stories of the people um, that are willing to sue, the stories of the people that speak out. That is what will change the church. We see that over and over again. That's how the policies change. Beautiful. Well, what a super powerful uh, six hours we've spent with you guys. Um, we, we go into depth here on Mormon Stories, but that part of that is, number one, to validate other people's experiences. I know... Colby Reddish has been watching along and he's just feeling so validated, but I know there's going to be thousands and tens of thousands of not only whistleblowers, but victims who are going to say me too, me too, me too, just from this episode, not to mention uh, Jehovah's witnesses and Scientologists and Catholics and evangelical Christians, 
because this problem is much bigger than just the Mormon church or even organized religion, as we know from the Boy Scouts. Right. So the only way things get better, like you said, is when there's, when there's settlements, when there's fees, uh, you know, when there's charges and when there's whistleblowers and, and when there's people who speak out and tell their story. So on behalf of the people who I love, the Mormon people and a church that I have a complex relationship with, and just on behalf of humanity, Margie and I just want to thank you both for coming all this way from, uh, from uh, Riverside, right? Yeah. Which is the Inland Empire, I'm yep. learning. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming all this way to help your fellow humans yeah. and to help protect future victims and whistleblowers from bad guys. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks Thank for having you. us. We appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, thanks to all of you who've joined us today. And thanks uh, to everyone who helped make, who helped make this episode possible. Uh, there's lots you can do. Please speak out. Uh, please tell your stories. Uh, please be whistleblowers. Please hold your church leaders accountable. Don't back down. Speak out. Um, and uh, you can also try to be influential with local laws to make your local states, um, you know, put pressure on their legislatures to make clergy mandated reporters um, and to make your whatever influence you have within the church, whether it's on bishops or state presidents or even area or general authorities to try and pressure them to make changes that will improve things. But uh, thanks for supporting us on Mormon Stories today. Um, check out the show notes for lots of cool references if you care about this topic. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate those who donate to Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation to make all this possible. We couldn't do it without your support. And uh, most importantly, uh, find follow the truth, find the healing, and um, be good to each other and be kind to each other. And uh, we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care, everybody.